Audio book title, Seal and Mana, 01-19, by Cordy. Chapter 1, Death and Rebirth. My name is Leon, and currently, I am in a very long line, waiting for reincarnation. And no, I am not joking. Right now, I am floating along hundreds of others, forming a straight line on a rainbow road in the middle of the grand nothingness. I tried looking left, right, up, and down, but there was nothing but the infinite cosmos in the rainbow road under my feet. Or, well, under me, as my feet are mangled horridly, facing the wrong way. Both of them, I can see the bones sticking out, but I feel no pain, and they aren't bleeding. Maybe because my head is also not where it should be. Still, it is being held by my only remaining arm, which listens to my thoughts. It's just I am at eye level with my innards hanging out of my stomach. Dude, what the hell happened to you? I hear the man behind me ask. Turning my head around. I met the eyes of a middle-aged guy with half of his face missing and his brain hanging out like some kind of jelly, constantly trembling as he moved his mouth. I was run over by an FM TV. What the hell is that? He recoiled, almost letting the brain slip out from his skull. A military truck from the past century. The damn driver was an amateur. When we were getting it out of storage, the idiot floored it, and it ran me over and blew me into pieces like some kind of vinata. Damn. But from the past century? Do you mean from the 1900s? Some kind of World War I era shit? Eh? I chuckled. From the 2000s. That isn't past century. It's 2004. Dude, you got rocked in the head by that truck harder than it looks. What 2004? It's 2144. I think you have some brain damage, mixing up the numbers of the calendar. Fuck you, you mangled cheese tart. He shouted, holding one hand against his brain ensuring it stayed there. And what happened to you? I chortled, looked into the barrel of the gun. It wasn't discharging. Wah ha ha ha, fucking idiot. I burst out laughing, making some of the others turn towards us, joining in on the fun too. Fuck you. He blew out from his nose, hitting me, and my already badly bent remaining arm slipped, and I dropped my head. I saw it falling to the deep nothingness, seeing the road grow smaller and smaller. Hearing the guy say it wasn't his fault. Idiot. Not that it matters. I died, and probably these are my last hallucinations before passing. My mind's manifestation was probably displaying the idiot who rode through me with that monster of a truck in this way. Just when I was starting to get my life into order. Typical me moment. I got myself a degree in robotics of past and present, and finally, I could afford a gene enhancement from the money I made from being hired by the military. Bye bye. Memorizing all the books trying to learn them. I could simply use my brain like a search engine, recalling everything I have ever read. And they say you can't pay to one in real life. I was even courting a cute girl. Everything was too good to be true. Ha. Huh. Error. Contamination on the cosmic reincarnation system? A voice said, coming from every direction. Great. Now my severed head has become nothing more but contamination. You know what? Fuck you too. Beginning cleaning process. Even if I wanted, I couldn't scream as another worldly force washed me over and made my head disappear, leaving me with only my brain there, continuing to fall downwards. I don't know how I remained conscious, but I still saw, heard, and smelled everything. Error. Contamination is passing through the realm's border. Abandoning process. Initiating emergency reincarnation. Spatial coordinates found. Commencing transfer. Huh? I wanted to ask something, but with a poof. Everything was gone and turned extremely dark. Was my brain finally destroyed? Two? Or? No. I was still here? W wait. I hear something. Sloshing? Muffled voices? Exclamation mark I managed to open my eyes, and I saw tiny hands before me, floating in some fluid in the dark. While I also saw an umbilical cord attached to my body. Shit. Am I an embryo? Wait. The fact I can open my eyes and look at the shape of my body. My baby body? What the hell? Am I being reborn? Did my brain get dropped into an unborn child? Was it empty? Or did I squash the previous occupant? Damn it. I need answers. Maybe it was my trashing that made it happen, but I suddenly found myself getting pushed out. Getting born. I wanted to curse, but I couldn't. I was simply hoping that if all this was real, I was not too early. 25. Chapter 2. Growing up, it turns out I wasn't dreaming. My weird experience was not a delirious dream while I was lying on the concrete floor after being run over by a monster of a vehicle. I indeed died. My head got pushed off from whatever I was standing on, and then I got dispatched into reincarnation. It probably shouldn't have happened that way, as I retained my memories and even my modified brain box. Just after coming out of my mother, 
The intense light pierced my eyes, making them water up, and the loud noises around me were just as painful to my ears. I tried covering it, flailing around, voicing my discontent with the whole situation, but I only managed to utter baby-like cries. Figures. It took me a day or two to get used to using my eyes, and finally, I could survey my surroundings. In those days, I was mostly in my mother's arms, who had long, blazingly red hair. She was a short but beautiful woman with breasts that would shame anyone I knew in my previous life. And now I had the privilege of sucking on them daily. This isn't that bad after all Tilda. When I was not immersed in sucking out my tasty daily meals, I was memorizing the words and world around me. My father was surprisingly tall and built like a tank, making me a bit jealous, to be honest. He reminded me of the ancient depictions of gods from the classical era. Not to mention her straight blonde hair and piercing blue eyes. I just hope I inherited his body, including his lady killer spear between his legs. Damn it, that thing was a weapon in itself, and I saw it in use. They never bothered with covering my crib when they went headed on the bed next to me. Not that I'm complaining. Besides that, I immediately recognized I was in a room that reminded me of old images of a medieval noble's chamber. Fancy rugs on the floor, a huge canopy bed. Paintings of my father in armor and grandiloquent robes, or with my mother. Elaborate carvings decorated all the wooden furniture. Even my crib looked like it should be in a museum or something. If my predictions were correct, I managed to be reborn into a life of privilege as some kind of noble's son. First born at that, as no siblings have come to visit me so far. Learning the language wasn't hard, I managed to do so by the time I turned one, surprising the two when I started speaking. In sentences, I may have taken this a bit too far, as my father threw a banquet for me, deciding to name me officially before my second birthday, which was a custom in this era, it seemed. Well, it was fine, but before they could be told me with a name that went into the registry of the country, I myself suggested that I should be named Leon. Now, with that, I have truly taken it too far as never before anything like this happened in history, I think. Luckily, my parents turned out to be extremely protective and good people as I was given the name Leon, and everyone was threatened by my father, if anyone leaked that his son was a bit abnormal, they would be cut into four pieces and thrown to the pigs. Watching the maids, some invited lower ranking nobles and merchants faces, he wasn't joking. At that point, I understood why he was named the Lion of the Frontier, Galosh, while my mother had the unofficial title of Handler of Galosh, Louise and I got myself the title Cub of Galosh. What's up with these people? To that question, I got my answer in the following years while growing up and being allowed to cheer our robust, sturdy castle in its cold, stone corridors. When I first went to the battlements and looked at the mountainous region, my jaws dropped to the floor. Seeing the picturesque scenery was a true gift. I still wasn't allowed to visit the town I could see from here. But if our home was the way it is, I not just reincarnated but also journeyed back in time a lot. Still, the first time I laid my eyes on the scenery, I was utterly mesmerized. So, it was a worthy trade-off. The horizon was dominated by tall, snow-capped mountain ranges with a lush valley before us, dotted by small villages and pastures in the distance. I was born in the summer, yet the air was still only around 20 Celsius, which made me realize the winters must be freezing out here. Our castle was located halfway up the mountain looking over the expanse of valley we were in. It wasn't a simple castle as it was also a fortress, guarding the passageway to the territory everyone called the frontier. By the myth and sagas my mother told me, it was a place filled with wild beasts and monsters that sometimes tried to come through and harass the people of Ishilia. At first, I didn't take it seriously, but it was rare that Ishilia didn't ring any bells for me. I was never a history buff, but I should know most of the kingdoms from medieval times and I was sure that something like that never existed. Not in Europe, at least. And I swore that my parents looked European. Call me Lulu and dress me in pink. This isn't Europe, was my first thought when I looked at the region's map in our study at the tender age of four. I was standing on two boxes to reach the table and glimpse at the things father left out on it, including a map of Ishilia. The region was anything but resembling any place I knew about. Holy shit, I wasn't on earth anymore. The revelation filled me with great excitement and expectations for my future. I couldn't read the text in any of the books or on the map, so I had to start learning the written language fast. I need to know more about where I am. Neither of my parents was surprised when I asked them to teach me, and my mother took on the role happily. Thanks to my brain still retaining all my previous memory and enhancements, 
it was easy. By the time I turned six, I was writing my own journal, noting all my ideas down in one place. Even if I could remember them perfectly, I liked pinning them down. It gave me a sensation of turning them partially real. What I spent the next years with was reading, reading, and more reading. Learning all that I could about the world I found myself in. Oh, and with training in the sword. My father was an excellent fighter. I highly valued soldier and commander, but a small ranking noble. What I thought of as a life of privilege turned out to be not really it. My family was nothing but a Viscount tasked with overseeing the frontier region. That meant this valley and the only entrance to the wilderness. Right where our castle was built, it was to be the first stop gate against incoming monsters. Something that was relatively important but also would be sacrificial if it came to that. It was a glorified outpost, a stop gate, nothing but a warning bell that immediately soured my perception of the Sicilian Empire or whatever. My mother came from a family of barons in the neighboring region, a vassal territory to ours, providing us with the necessary food that our soldiers consumed yearly. As to how they met. Going by my father's words, he begged his parents to set up a marriage when he first saw her as a kid. Looking at it from my crib as a baby, they did love each other very much. Maybe even too much? Anyway, it turns out that my family does not really have any real power in any other place in the empire. They are nothing but glorified guard dogs of the border region. A pretty good one at that, I must say. I was nine when I first experienced what it means to watch beasts trying to get into the kingdom. In the winter. There were three to five meter tall creatures throwing themselves at the outmost walls and traps we had built up in the previous decades and by the previous owners of this castle. Father was fighting them back valiantly with the soldiers, and he even led a cavalry attack, leaving the fort, sweeping the escaping ones in one of the battles. We were eating well that winter. They mostly resembled giant felines from Earth's prehistoric days, but I also noticed some had magical capabilities like breathing fire. It was that moment when I learned that magic existed in the world, albeit finding mages was rare as anyone with the power to control mana was a strategic resource. Going by my parents' remarks, all the mages that Ishulia had kept their identities hidden and served as secret weapons of the empire, guaranteeing national security against rival kingdoms and empires. My home, this so-called Ishulian empire, was not a peaceful place at all. While I was born into a family that guarded their back, the forefront of Ishulia was constantly expanding, gobbling up small countries and city-states. It was waging wars with its neighbors in almost every decade, puppeteering others, only resting to recoup their losses between skirmishes and campaigns. I bet we were hated for real by the others, but it also shown that my home country had superior strength to remain standing and not collapse. Good. If it's like this, then I prefer being in the rear and out of harm's way, thinking about it. I didn't have to worry about being assassinated or some other ploy playing out to get me for another family to rise to prominence and replace us. Besides training with dad, I was anxious to try and cast magic. I was sure I would be unique. Well, I was already that, but everyone hopes for more, don't we? This time, I had to be disappointed. I had zero magic. None. Nil. Zilch. It was proven when the local church of the Pathan of Gods, the religion prevalent in the world, tested my compatibility with a strange orb. Saying that I was crestfallen is an understatement. I still asked my parents if I could read some magic books, and they somehow acquired some beginner stuff I memorized at once. Turns out magic is more complex than I first thought. It is not just waving your hand or a wand, saying the magic words, and poof, a firebolt comes out of it. No, it has multiple, long incantations and formations to adhere to. And the mage may have to hold unique crystals to support the spells and his or her powers. It is used as a kind of conduit and fuel to channel and amplify their mind, which was flowing through it. Reading the introduction showed that casting a strong fireball that could decimate multiple troops required the mage to stand still, mutter the incantation, draw a formation, and do numerous nonsensical things just to cast it. This is so bad. I bit my lips, reading it, it does have great power. But a mage is fucked if someone surprises him or her. Well, they can scribe down their spells on special paper, creating one time use scrolls, but I found no books describing the process and things needed for it. But, it did give me an idea. Looking at the beginner magic formations, at first, they looked complicated. After further study, it finally clicked for me. These were similar to blueprints and programs from my time, like how some top of the line, anti grav, or laser weaponry functioned, mixed with old age mechanisms. I am not saying this was a one-to-one -one copy of that, 
but the principle is very similar. I only had to replace the energy source with mana, and the coating with formations, with a bit of modifications. I think I can replicate stuff, I murmured, studying the basics, getting a new idea rooted in my brain. I can't cast magic, but that does not mean I can use the magical formations fueled by the mage's energy source, those conduit thingies, if I can get my hand on it. But, that would be like wanting to buy plutonium. I don't think they are available at the corner store. Wait, do we even have a corner store here? I don't think so. What I have seen so far of our land is that we only have mud or stone roads. No electricity, no plumbing, and no heating system. Honestly speaking, we are living like a barbarian in my eyes. Huh, even bathing is a pain in the ass. Maybe I should worry about those things first instead of thinking about magic. 24. Chapter 3 coming to age. Not bad. I said to myself, standing nakedly before a mirror. Although it was not a perfect mirror, it was more like a big bronze plate reflecting my appearance. I was happy with what I was seeing. My body was improving daily. I was athletic and attractive with my slick, red hair and green eyes. A perfect mix if I say so myself. I was only 15, but damn, I looked charming. Thanks, mom and dad for giving me some great genes. When I turned 12, I was officially recognized as an adult, and in the past three years, I have been helping out my mother. She was the one governing the villages, and I was traveling alongside her to act as a judge when disputes arose amongst the people. We were listening to complaints and problems, trying to negotiate solutions with other regions and boys, or acting as witnesses to deals and trials. It was pure politics, and I was surprised to see how fluently my mother navigated through it. I? I don't think I have the same patience that she does. Also, I never wondered why my father trusted her with it. He was much more explosive in temper and quick in making decisions. Well, it did suit him on the battlefield. Despite his size, he was fast and agile, and his reflexes were such that I suspected he was also a transmigrated soul with an enhanced body. But that did not come clutch when it was about dealing with people. For that, my mother perfectly balanced him out. Only a few days ago, when I turned 15, I was given full reign of my life. I completed my studies of our land and its functions under my mother's watchful eyes. Now, I was to act on my own and gain experience in the world. They made me sit down with them yesterday and told me that in the next three years, I will be left to my own devices. They won't step in and only help out if I come up with a sensible request. Taking in like making a deal with another region's ruler. They wanted to see how I fared before I was marked as the inheritor of the line of Kolosh. Good. Exactly what I wanted. And I think they understood my happiness from the light that danced in my green eyes. First things first. I started to dress up. Turning away from my reflection. While I murmured. Reciting the points from my notebook that I had used in the past years. We need roads, running water, plumbing, and a sewer system. We are in the mountains. We have multiple rivers and places where the snow never melts. We have ample sources for it. And I bet we have big underground reservoirs that we don't know about. We need to get into animal farming. Our place is unsuitable for growing big swaths of wheat or whatever else. So we have to focus on what we can. We need better support besides importing food from my mother's home region resources. We need more resources. I saw how we are being ripped off by others who provide the raw metals and weapons for our armies. Soldiers who are defending their greedy asses. We need to start to open up mines and survey the mountains. The pitiful surface level operations we have is laughable. Modernization. But, those things can wait. First things first. I need to survey the towns and villages under our rule to determine which points are the most important. Thinking about it. I just couldn't wait to leave the castle. I already informed my parents that I plan to travel a little. I may be away for a month or so, visiting all the major cities and outposts, even if there is not much in our territory. Besides the town at the foot of the mountain, which housed around 5,000 souls, the rest of the settlements had a maximum of 1,000 people in them. Our whole region was as backwater as it gets, at the size of around 40,000 square kilometers and no more. In contrast, my mother's home region was double that, while the Cinderol region, where the capital city was built, was around 150,000 square kilometers. My goal with this trip was to familiarize myself with the terrain and the people and, most importantly, to search for things others missed. Resources that could be useful. I had to be back before winter settled in, as traveling in the heavy snow would be more dangerous than anything. Father does keep a firm grip over the territory, so the threat of bandits should be low. They are not non-existent 
as evil is always present where people live, then I should be fine with the training I received. I should also try and invent something more. Deadly. Or would it be? Too much? I thought out loudly while fastening my long sword on my waist. It was a simple, undecorated piece of metal made for killing and not for showing off. I was pretty proficient with it, learning my father's methods by watching him and making him proud. He said that if I kept bulking, I would be able to match his raw strength. But no thanks. I like myself to find and lean, and he... Well, damn, he is big. Would he think of me weirdly if I brought some firearms into a world of swords and shields? Or would he think of it as an improved archery? Something that my mother was proficient with. He didn't look down on that. But guns. A. I will put it on the end of the list. I am not here to start killing people anyway. I grinned, slapping my face before leaving my room. That's right. I am not here to conquer the world. No. I am here to build up my region. I am bound to inherit it, especially because after my birth, my mom failed to get pregnant again. Was it my fault? I hope not. Even if it was, then it is my duty to provide her with some grandchild. I caught them speaking about it once, thinking of getting me wives so they have more heirs. And yes, they talked about it in the plural sense. Thanks, mom, you are the best. It also made me realize that the living standards are low, child mortality is high, and people don't live that long. No wonder they don't name the kids out of superstition until they turn two. My father was only 33 now, and my mom was 30. Which meant when I came into this world, my dad was only 18 and my mom 15. And they were trying to make me for three years already. Damn, medieval ages. You are wild. They still looked young now, but that is because they were nobles. Regular people may live 40 or 50 years if they are lucky. This had to be changed. Better. Longer life. More kids. More time to grow. More time to gain experience. And more time to enjoy life. Yes. Enjoying life. That is going to be my goal. I am okay being stuck in here. Enjoying the peace. The clean air. And the beautiful scenery. Ah precisely what my world already forgot about. I will also need to be careful not to mess it up. I don't want to bring in technology from my memories that would start polluting the world. But, exactly, that is what magic is for, no? I have so many ideas, but first and foremost, I need to get some of those magic crystal things. And more refined knowledge about magic. I need to find a mage for that. How will I do it? I don't know. But everything will come to a place, if nothing else. I will just swing it. It will be fine. I'm sure. Dot. Dot. Ah. The fresh air. I took a deep breath, walking down the stone road, snaking down from the castle to the valley, watching the emerald fields and its lush grass fields, sparkling with the morning dew still sticking to it. I wasn't going alone as father made it to the leg. A warrior from his personal unit was following me. I was wearing a simple leather outfit. Best for traveling long distances and easily withstanding the wear and tear of the wilderness. With my hide already at 180 centimeters and still growing, I was destined to reach my father's size of almost 200 centimeters, at least, vertically. Then my eyes traveled to Oleg, who was even taller, with long, braided black hair and piercing blue eyes. His height was, if I had to guess, probably around 220 or 230 centimeters and his body was just like my father's. I was wondering how he managed to get in and out of the barracks of the castle, maybe only sideways, as he was built like a rhino. Was it because of my father? Did he make every personal soldier of his palm iron daily? Probably. Young lord, he noticed my gaze as he walked beside me. You need not worry. I will protect you with my life if it comes to that. I am not worried about that, Oleg. If I would face life-threatening attacks in my father's territory, I would be disappointed. True. He laughed, slapping my shoulders, making me feel like I was hit by a truck once again. It would be our shame as soldiers of Kalash. Soldiers, are you guys being called the pride of Kalash or something like that? Wah ha ha ha. Yes, yes, but we are not to repeat it too much. Out of humility, it is what the common folk call us, but we are just soldiers. Common folk. Eh? I murmured, looking towards the most significant town we had here, the so-called capital of the region. Lionheart, our castle was overlooking it from a bit farther away, up on the side of the mountains, and it was the picturesque image of what most medieval towns were in the history books. That was where we were heading right now. It won't be my first time coming here. I visited many of the settlements, but I did it with my mother. I entered the carriage in the castle, I exited it at the local noble's courtyard. I never walked their streets. I was mainly in the background, 
dress in the attire of a clerk or an insignificant helper. I wasn't really introduced, so people would ignore me, and I could survey them more easily from the back. Mother's mind did work in weird ways sometimes. I did wonder now how people would react to me. Would they recognize me? Would they see my parents' features in me? Probably yes. That is why I was wearing a hat. Hiding my crimson hair. I was hoping I could pass on as an adventurer while a leg was my companion or master. He couldn't pass on as anything else but a warrior. It simply was ingrained into his body since birth. I was so excited. Adventuring in a completely different world. I have been waiting for this since my rebirth. 23. Chapter 4. Reality. Shit. It was the first thing that came to my mind. Walking into the town on the cobblestone road. When I previously visited. I exited the carriage at the mayor's house, which was in a private courtyard at the other end of the town. This time, we were coming in on foot, walking along the northern road, which was pretty deserted. It led to our castle, so not many would use it, and not many people were there to see us arrive. There were no walls here. It was pretty open, built in a flat area where the houses sprung up naturally throughout the years, resulting in many sneaking roads and dark alleyways. It was a little labyrinthian. But it gave it a unique charm. Scouring my memories, our cities were all planned. Everything was straight, meeting at a 90 degree angle. It made sense. It was clean. Lying hard before me, anything but. I barely managed to step over the pile of shit left on the cobblestone by a horse. Who knows when. It was what prompted me from my previous outburst. For Oleg, this was perfectly normal. He didn't even notice it. Nor did he wrinkle his nose as we walked over it and headed into the city, passing by the many wooden houses until we arrived on the main street. I had to repeatedly curse, dodging dong mines. Shit. I repeated under my breath as the clean, fresh air was gone, replaced by the stench of piss, shit, and who knows what. I was expecting a fantasy-esque town. Maybe some colorful houses? None. All was brown because of the wood it was built from, only colored a little by the stroves they had. Okay. There were a few lighter colored houses made out of cob, the mixing of clay-based subsoil, sand, straws, and water. The wealthier people managed to erect stone houses, but those were extra rare. I know that the mayor had his made out of it. And the temple of the Pantheon of Gods was also a beautiful and sturdy building made of lime mortar and some other stuff I didn't recognize. The roads? Those were made out of cobblestone and dirt. Or more shit. I couldn't tell because everything was stinking like the nine hells. I saw people throwing buckets of something into side alleyways, out of sight. But, fuck, this was not just looking dire or smelling nasty. It was a biohazard waiting to explode. We need a proper sewer system. And I wasn't thinking about modern things. Hell, I remember reading about the Roman times. We solved the problem way earlier then. Whenever this was, whatever timeline I was reborn into, is something the matter, young lord? Oleg asked, noticing me wincing and grimacing constantly as we walked towards the market square. A lot, I answered, trying not to hold my nose and look like some kind of snobbish brat. This place is a mess. I remember going to a small village with my mother, where I felt it was okay, but, this, this is a town? What the hell? This is a cesspit, young lord? He asked again confused as he found nothing out of the ordinary or any reason I would say that. In his eyes, it was a lovely town, with many people present, so it was lively both in the daytime and at night. Don't mind me. I shrugged, looking around, and most people ignored us, or me, to be honest. Many did peek at leg. He was huge, but nobody had the gall to gaze at him for long before turning away or walking around us. I simply used to. More cleaner places. Well, Maids maintain the castle daily, here, that can't be done. He nodded, thinking about it, scratching his chin. Not that. Ah, no matter, no matter. Let's go to the temple. Why? He asked but still started to lead me to it. I want to see it, that is all. I was wondering about it as my father always mentions Tuba this and Tuba that, while my mother answers that Ariana would do this and Ariana would do that, and, young lord, they never explained, they did. I shrugged, I know that six deities were visiting our world once. Of course, I didn't mention that I believed none of it. From those six, one was a man named Tuba who was a warrior, upholding justice. Hogwash, if you ask me. Of course, I would also not say that out loud as everyone seemed to take it seriously, as if they witnessed it. The woman named Ariana was smart and just, but her wrath could turn day into night and summon demons from hell itself. Which sounded like an angry wife to my ears. Yes, yes. 
Oleg nodded rapidly as we walked towards a temple. The pantheon is made up of the six deities. Besides Tubu and Aryana, Wyland, Valen, Elise, and Orsi are the rest. MHM, I know of their names, but I will be honest. I'm not really into believing in deities. There are many proofs, young lord. Oleg explained while we arrived, entering the temple and walking into the domed, clean building, and the fresh scent of burning incense assaulted my senses. Ah. The relief from the smell of shit. Temples are not that bait after all. Sure. I answered, not really listening to him, listing out all the marks littering our world. In my previous life or now, I wasn't interested in old fairy tales. The inner sanctum was decorated with their statues, standing in a circle, studying their figures. They were nothing extravagant, but I noticed they all wore a similar robe, colored black and purple. Three of them were men, while the other three were women. I quickly lost all interest, regarding them the same as our old, ancient people's nonsense. What I was genuinely interested in was the temple itself and how it was built. I walked around and studied the walls, the seams between its blocks. The work on the statues, the marks on the floor, and the ceiling. All this pointed out that we had the technology to build something modern, something sturdy. I would bet a lot that this temple could withstand some abuse or survive a fire. The houses in the city? Not so much. Good. Then this also means it is not the problem of can we do it? Instead, it is a problem of how much will it cost? Where did the stones come from? I asked Oleg, not expecting an answer. But I turned out to be lucky. The temple was built long ago. He explained after recalling his memories. The church was financed by the empire. They opened a mine in the mountains. A few hundred kilometers away from here. It was mined and cut to pieces there. Then transported here. Why don't we do the same? I asked. Turning towards him in surprise. The buildings here are ultra shabby. But, young lord. We can't. He said. Gobsmacked. First of all. We don't have the resources or money to buy the equipment and people to start mining and transporting. Secondly, the thing that holds stone buildings together is a national secret. Only the Empire can send artisans out to build something out of stone. Even your own home, the Fortress of the Wild, was built in his own by the Empire. What a pain in the ass! I groaned, rubbing my head. Is everyone this paranoid here? Young Lord? Nothing. Blake. I waved my hand. I saw what I wanted. Let's go. But... No prayer, young lord? He asked, a bit conflicted, bowing towards the statues. None. I am not a fan of that. Now, I want to see all the stone buildings in the city. Can you show me around? Why yes. He hurried after me, continuing to play the role of a somewhat confused guide. The whole day was about nothing else but surveying the masonry works of the empire. I studied all the buildings that were not erected by locals but by government-employed artisans. It was evident that everything was determined by money. The mayor's place was only 40% close to what the temple looked like, in build quality at least. Other, wealthier nobles' place was even less well-built, but at least it was made from rock and stone and had some style to it. The fact that they kept something as simple as mortar secret was sick. Paranoid beyond belief. I will need to start from scratch. By nightfall. I was in my room at the local inn, finishing washing up from cold water poured out in a bucket, using rags to clean myself. This also needs to change. I need to start introducing running water in bath houses and personal hygiene. I don't care if they look at me really that I want to bathe and clean myself daily. Damn it, I'm not a barbarian. With anger, I opened up my little notebook after sitting down on the edge of my bed, naked, and started writing. There is a lot to be done. 18. Chapter 5 during the following days, I did nothing else but walk up and down in the town. Most people were already familiar with my face, deeming me a weirdo as I drew a street map in my notebook, muttering to myself. I spent two weeks doing it, recording all the details and amazing alike with my cityscape drawings. He said I could easily be a painter as my pencil sketches looked like he was staring at reality itself. I think he was simply trying to butter up to me. I don't think they are that cake squares into a sophisticated, but it felt nice being appreciated. I like compliments as I am a simple man. Somehow, I always missed it in my previous life. I got nothing from home in life, not until I got older. And then, when I did, I was dead the next day. Oh well, there is no point in wallowing in it. Instead, I should wallow because this is a complete mess. Not cake squares into a sophisticated, I moaned, sitting with a leg in my room on the tavern's second floor. Looking at the torn out pages, forming a detailed map of the whole town. I think it looks horrific, 
young lord, it is more detailed than what we have at the castle. No, I am talking about how this city was built. I pointed at the snaking streets, their crisscrossing form, and how it was more like a labyrinth than a city. It is a mess. No symmetry and no elegance. It was built haphazardly, attaching new roads, houses, and buildings to each other, wherever you felt like it. But, it's normal. Young lord, this how cities are made. Then we will change it. Start from zero. You can't just destroy a city. That will lead to an uprising, young lord. Not to mention, the empire would take it as an attack on itself. All this is the property of the ruling emperor or empress, even if it's under your control, young lord. Think about it, Oleg exclaimed, going into a panic. Relax, my truck-sized friend. Truck what? He asked, blinking his eyes rapidly. Not getting it. No matter. I am not demolishing the city. I will build a new one. My own. I laugh loudly, throwing off the papers from the desk and laying out different ones, a whole set of them, showing a perfectly designed city. By my calculations, this new one could house at least 50,000 people. It should be enough for the whole region. I already designed it to be perfectly sensible and symmetric to look at. In the middle would be the royal sector. Of course, I am everything but a saint. I need my own place. So, I totally stole the idea of the Forbidden City's plans and laid it out to be my next home. It should give enough space to live comfortably. Next, I designed it so that the homes of my future, most trusted partners would be around it, surrounding me. I need to recruit people I can rely on. I wouldn't be able to do everything alone. I need some excellent brains to help me govern this shithole KHM region. Yes, the shitting problem would be solved too. My lord? Oleg asked, seeing me grinning and giggling like an idiot. Nothing. I shook my head, running my finger along the sewer system drawn on my plans. I will make a city so clean you can lick the ground and not get sick. I also designed it to have trees and a lot of green plant and wild building. I want colors, beautiful trees blooming in the spring, and the smell of flowers when you walk down the main street. It will be the desired holy place for anyone in this sorry world. Huh. On the outer skirts should be the rest of the housing for the people, shops, markets, whatever I need to run the city. I was expecting it to be booming and blooming every day. I want it to be the heart of the region where people come to visit and spend their money. Money. I whispered my biggest opponent right now. I don't even know if the locals have enough to afford anything. Huh. So, I will need to ensure we get the ball rolling, if I can push it down the hill. It will snowball, I think. I'm not really a finance guru. But even I know we will need to step up our industrial sector for that to happen. Which will be at a different place. I don't want to pollute my future home. It was the thought that led me to my next goal, the mountains. Recollecting my plans, I asked Oleg to lay down the map of the surrounding mountains. Especially where the stone came for the building of the Pantheon. I will visit that next and see what I can do with it. I won't build from wood that can rot away and be burnt down by an invading force or monsters. Everything will be sturdy and heavy of stone to withstand the ages, nature, and magic. I need to make sure we are magic proof. As to how? Well, I will come up with something. Or I will rename myself to Lulu. Dot. Dot. Traveling to the mountains was much harder than I thought it would be. The footpath was overgrown, and we had to track through a challenging, uneven terrain while getting closer to the old site where the church mined the rocks for its purposes. It took us four days of literal marching, watching the mountainous horizon getting bigger and bigger. It was a sight to behold for sure, seeing the snow-capped tips getting closer and more prominent day by day. I was loving it. The air was so clean and fresh, with one deep breath. I was rejuvenated at once. Young Lord, we will need to get a bit more alert now, Oleg said, constantly surveying our surroundings as we were heading into the pine forest surrounding the basin of the mountains. His giant hand was resting on the hilt of his sword, making me furrow my brows. Are there bandits here? You can never know, he replied, walking in front of me. There are some old logging sites around here. But they have been abandoned for decades now. We switched to a different location to let the forest regenerate. There are always little lives around places like this. No matter what you do, some people choose to be evil. When you can take others' property, why work hard? True, I told you my head, finding no fault in his words. And people like them don't do well in society, so they are drawn to places like this. Like rats, living in others' hopes and dreams. You can be surprisingly deep, Oleg. I laughed pointing a thumbs up toward his back. Thank you, young lord. He laughed sheepishly. I try to read a lot. It is a privilege to be able to read. A gift bestowed upon us soldiers by your esteemed father. Wait. You don't learn reading? I asked, surprised. 
almost tripping up myself. Not really. He looked at me over his shoulder. The average citizen gets to learn a little, but most can only write their own names and read short, simple notices. Anything complicated, long, or filled with flowery words is going to be lost to them. No fucking way. I groaned, rubbing my temples with two hands. Then I will need public education, too? Shit, another problem. Okay, okay, I will deal with that too. Fuck, young lord. You want to teach the people? He asked, stopping. Looking stunned. Of course. I shrugged, opening my arms wide. What should I do with a bunch of illiterate people? How would I be able to trust anything they do? Should I do everything by myself? I am not a mule. I need qualified people who can think for themselves, and I can delegate the tasks so I can focus on the big picture. Let my subordinates micromanage it. I will do the macro side of it. What are micro and macro? Young lord? He asked, scratching his head. Looking lost, no matter. The thing is, Oleg, reading and knowing numbers is something essential. I will need all of my subjects to be capable of doing it. Everyone? Everyone. I quoted a famous line, proud of myself. But I also knew he didn't understand it. But he still wiped his eyes of tears. How benevolent. My lord, you're a truly good person. Eh? Am I? Er. Well. If you say it. Um. Sure. I guess. Yes. You young lord. He shouted and lunged at me. I didn't know what was happening. But when I was on the ground, shielded by his big body, I noticed the arrow landing close to us. It would have missed me, shooting at my feet instead. Honestly, it looked like a warning shot, if anything. But I was still touched by his quick reaction and going so far and protecting me. But I was not a fan of being squashed by a big, muscular guy lying on me. Why couldn't he be a beauty? Huh? Well... At least I know that I can keep my mind clear and calm even in danger. 17. Chapter 6. Shadow People. In reality, Oleg only laid on me for a brief moment before jumping up, grabbing me by the scruff, and dragging me into the forest, hiding behind one of the thick trees. With his long sword at the ready, peering out, his eyes were searching for the attacker like a hawk scans the land for prey. I wasn't complaining. A little roughing up is not something that would kill me and he was my bodyguard anyway. It could have been a warning shot, I said calmly, looking out, watching the improvised arrow stuck in the ground. It was something that was not the work of a blacksmith but more like something thrown together haphazardly. They aimed at you, my lord. Their life is forfeit. I'm just saying. I shrugged, not wanting to argue. Oh. At ten o'clock. At what? Huh? There. I pointed it out for him. Where I saw the shrubs move on the other side. They probably retreated. Nice catch. We are going back and reporting this to Lord Galosh. We are going to come back with force and find these bandits. Whoa. Whoa. Relax a leg. Bandits. Why are we not surrounded in? Why are we not robbed yet? They may have been only scouts. Do bandits use twigs and stone arrows? Because if they do, I am not really afraid of them. I shrugged, patting the authentic steel sword in my waist. You want to follow them? Oh, you are sharper than I expected. Yep, I do. I laughed, feeling excited. Young lord, that is not a good idea. You can go back and make your report. I am going after them while their trail is hot. Damn it. Oleg cursed as I was already striding forward, crossing the clearing and heading towards where I saw movement before. I was in the army previously. I mean, in my original life, I wasn't always responsible for unearthing ancient machines. No, I was part of my home country's mobile regiment and was a combat engineer on the front lines when our forces were sent to deal with insurgency. Some still thought it was the Third World War, yet that shit ended when I was four. I am trying to say that I had lived combat experience before being called back and given a safer position. It happened after proving myself and my skills with machines. And then I was killed by essentially a friendly fire accident. Wonderful. Oh? I stopped, hearing voices in the distance signaling to Oleg who asked no questions but likewise slowed down, catching up to me. We inched forward slowly, trying to make as little noise as possible and listening into the conversation. You idiot. Why did you shoot at them? Now they know we are here. A man shouted at another. It snapped. I didn't want to shoot. I will snap you into two two. Idiot. Now they will bring people here, and we will be discovered. She will be discovered. Hey! I whispered to Oleg. Can you disarm the two? And capture them alive? Alive? Confused, he asked. We should chop their heads off and display them on bikes. Er, no, then we won't have a chance to question them. Or if you can evoke some kind of spell to speak to the dead. I can't cast magic, young lord. See? So, 
Can you capture them or not? I think I can. Good. Do that for me. Okay, the significant advantage of being the son of the region's lord is that our subordinates do listen to our orders. Seeing my order, Oleg didn't question it a second time and stepped forward faster than his big, bulky body would suggest. Before the two had any reaction, he was between them, bringing down his sword and knocking the shouting one out. Its palm were landing square on the back of his head, and it was lights out at once. Next, before his panicked, surprised partner could get anything out of his belt. Oleg punched him in the gut. I could only hear grunting and gurgling, and his body collapsed. Weak. He said, his voice betraying his surprise while I walked out looking at the two figures. Of course they are. Look at them. They are bare bones. Crouching down, turning them to their backs, revealed their emaciated figures. They were grossly underweight, wearing shabby clothes that looked like what you would find on a nature-loving elf from some fantasy story. Or on a sociopath. Living in the forest for 40 years, I couldn't tell their age, but I was sure they would be in their 30s. Or 40s, maybe younger, but had a hard life. Let's get some vines and tie them up. I said, kicking away their weapons that looked like tools from the stone age. Good idea. He nodded, and they were already tied to a tree by the time one of them was in the middle of deciding whether to wake up or not. Exclamation mark he wanted to cry but couldn't as the sharp pain assault in his head from where Oleg hit him with the palm of his sword. Any excuses before being dealt judgment? Oleg asked, sneering. You can't just kill us. We are the man panicked. But Oleg smacked him so hard that I saw a tooth flying out. You attacked the son of the lion himself. You will be flayed alive. Your skin fed to you. And then you will be tied to a pole so the animals from the other end of the mountains come and snack on you. Err. I spoke up. Twitching my mouth, you scared him a bit too much. But it's true, my lord. He protested, a simple beheading is not enough of a punishment. Whatever, he fainted. I shrugged with a groan, rubbing my forehead. Next time, I will ask questions, you just stay alert, okay? It took me a little effort to wake up the other guy, the one who had supposedly shot the arrow at me. When he heard who I was, he fainted too. Great, I was getting annoyed. So I decided to wake them up with a splash. Of course, I won't use water on them. That would be a waste. So I simply pissed on them until they woke up. What? I asked Oleg, who looked on, his jaw hanging close to the floor. My lord, you're pitiless. Efficient. I ain't wasting our drinking water on two idiots. Now, I turned to the two, who were just as dazed as what had just happened. I want to hear everything you know, or my friend here will break your legs and we will drag you back to the city for your public execution. None of them fainted again this time, and I quickly learned of their predicament. They called themselves shadow people because they were citizens who somehow slipped down to the absolute bottom and left their towns and villages, deciding to live in the forest. On paper, they didn't even exist anymore. Their current base was at the old logging site, and their little collective numbered around a dozen men and women, led by their queen. It's an interesting title, to say the least. What is special about this queen? I asked, feeling the weird reverence in their voices. She can. Shut up. Now, this was interesting. Suddenly they were not so keen on speaking anymore. I looked at Oleg, who slapped a few teeth out of them once again. But none budged. Now, this was most interesting. Something is so special about that woman that they grow a backbone? Huh. How long would it be to send a message back? I asked, crossing my arms. If I run. I can return with people on horses by dawn. Do it. Bring enough men so we can capture everybody. I'll stay here, guarding these two. My lord, that is too dangerous. Enough. I put my foot down, looking up at him with a serious gaze. Who am I? Lord Leon, the young cub of the Lion of the Frontier. Then do as I say. The more you dally, the longer I will remain alone. Yes, young lord. He saluted and sprinted away as if his life depended on it. Now. I crouched down, watching their faces with a soft smile. Won't you tell me what is so special with your queen? No. They answered, but I saw in the eyes of the more submissive one that he was ready to spill the beans. I see. Okay. I pulled out my sword and knocked out the more aggressive one with another pommel strike. I think they may have brain damage now. Oh well, let's talk. I looked at his comrade. We are going to make a simple deal. Whatever the outcome is, you won't be killed, nor tortured. I chuckled a little, feeling like I was playing some kind of villain in a school play. You swear? He asked, already gulping the bait down with hook and sinker. How desperate can one be? On my name is the son of Golash, our queen is special. She can. 
At that, he went mute for a little. I wasn't hurrying him, simply watching his face, reading his emotions. He was part hesitant, part guilty about what he was about to do. She is a mage. Really? I asked, my voice loud, scaring some of the birds away from the treetops. Tell me more. Her name is... Well, I don't know what her name is, but she was born in the capital city. In our territory. Or are you talking about the Empire's capital? Here. He added quickly, a simple commoner. My lord. It was discovered early that she could do things. Sometimes tools around her levitated when she was sleeping. That is what I heard. And what is she doing in the forest with a bunch of hobos? Hobo? No matter. He murmured, thinking it was some fancy word and it best not to ask about the language of aristocrats. Her parents didn't want to give her up. So they fled into the forest and have lived here ever since. We gathered around them because she can do things. Heal injuries and make miracles. Miracles, eh? I scratched my chin, even more interested now. I don't believe in miracles, but I do believe in magic. I can't wait to meet one who can cast it. Lucky. Uh, hey ha ha. In the end, I may just get what I was missing. I whispered, walking up and down before the two men and couldn't wait for Oleg to return. 19. Chapter 7, A Witch. Oleg arrived right by dawn. He looked out of breath but still full of energy, followed by a dozen warriors, all from my father's personal men. You are fast? I laughed, welcoming them. Ignoring the two who were still tied to the trees, moaning, and admitting we weren't kidding about who we were. Of course, young lord. He hopped down from the horse, breathing out with relief that I was okay. We should be enough to deal with any ragtag bunch who took up residence in our forest. I already investigated where they are. I said loudly, looking at the rest, dismounting their horses. Do you all know where the old logging site is? Good. I grinned, seeing them nod, we are going to travel there on foot. Tie the horses up, I explained, showing them a drawing on the ground. While waiting, I wasn't just chatting with the prisoners. I made sure they told me everything about the place, and I drew it out, making my plans. We would surround the site and ambush them. I told Oleg that there was a wild mage inside, and his face went dark, listening to everything I said. First, he wanted to complain it was sneaky and dishonorable to do so, but after saying there is a witch, he no longer complained. That is the power of magic. I already knew it was a rare and unique gift. So much so that most people thought a mage could do anything. Don't worry. She is untrained and weak. I continued. Trying to keep the men calm and collected. And we went to capture them alive. Okay. Use non-lethal attacks. What? They asked. Making me twitch my eyes. Don't kill. Please. I need them. Think. If we can capture them. We can control the witch. If you kill them. What if she goes apeshit and conjures something to kill us all? Huh? Think a little man. With hostages, she will come with us peacefully. My lord. Are you sure? With a witch around, it will be fine. I want her to join us, not to threaten. When the initial shock has settled down, let me talk, okay? Young lord, relax. Trust me. If I come and like, oh hello. I am the son of the lord of this region. I am here to recruit you. Blah blah blah. She would think I want no place to call her under and keep her as a pet. Why else would she be out here? She values her freedom, for sure. So, I think the quickest method to get her is to be more straightforward and... Well, we need to show our strength. Show her we can do this multiple ways, and I am open to taking the cooperative route. They had no real answer to my monologue, but that was good. I was already excited to do it. So we left for the logging site after going over the plan a second time. It wasn't that far, only an hour of walking distance, following the old route now overgrown with shrubs. When we got close, we could hear the noise they were making, waking up and starting their morning routine. Spreading out, I also took part in the ambush, rushing in from the front side of the place. Surveying it, it had some old warehouse, a few buildings, and many shabby tents held up by sticks, leaves, and what not. It was worse than a shanty town from my time. I think some homeless people lived better than these poor men and women. Yes, both were present. Hell, I think there were more women than men. Not that there were many of them. Around 20 people at most, all of them scrawny and dirty. There, I quickly singled out who I thought must be the witch. She had a different door covering her. Yes, her clothes were rags thrown around her bony body. Her thick, bushy, dark, orange-colored hair and leaves stuck to it and her face blackened by dirty spots. But she exuded something unnatural from her pores that even I could pick up. It is hard to put it into words, 
but it is the same feeling when you open the door to a cool cellar on a hot summer day. I was aiming for her from the moment I noticed her coming out from one of the wooden sheds. She was clearly panicked, not knowing what to do, but I couldn't take chances. If she really was a witch, she could be dangerous. I read about how those who never were educated caused themselves and everyone around them to blow up. Of course, I had my doubts, but it never hurts to be careful. I was before her in a few seconds, using the techniques from my past life, quickly wrestling her to the ground before she could cast any spells. Don't move or try anything, if you try releasing any magic. Otherwise, I will have to hurt you. I shouted, seeing and feeling her tremble while I knelt on her back, pinning her to the ground. Don't hurt them. She cried, thinking this was all caused by her. Well, it wasn't that far off the truth. I won't. Pulling her up, I held her arms locked behind her back with one hand, holding my sword with the other. She was unhealthy and slim. So much so that I think I could have broken her bones if I had twisted her a little more. Don't struggle, and you won't be hurt. We are soldiers of the line himself, as the son of Gulash. I give my word you won't be killed if you give up now. I was surprised that my words had any effects. Many stopped struggling or trying to fight back. They were simply giving up. Looking at me, my blazing red hair probably gave it away that I wasn't lying. Besides my mother. I didn't see anybody with the same scarlet color parading around this part of the country. When everybody was under control, I made them gather, and my men tied their arms behind their backs as to my instructions. I did the same with the witch, and they'd be extra careful. I also covered her mouth. I know they had to say incantations to cast a spell. I just hoped saying it in their head was not enough. Listen. I looked at them while Oleg and two other soldiers stood behind me. Holding crossbows at the ready. Two of you attacked me yesterday. Seeing how they looked around, realizing who was missing, and the change in their faces. I knew the two, left with the horses, were probably hiccuping like mad. He totally deserved. Fighting back the urge to laugh, I continued seriously, as if I was taking a huge risk here. I ought to execute all of you for this capital offense. Ignoring the loud cry for mercy, I continued on. If not that. The simple fact that you are squatting here is worthy of serious punishment. Not to mention, having a rouge witch. I looked at the girl who had tears in her eyes, looking around at the others, trying to apologize with her gaze. Now I truly felt like a villain. Shit. Well, suck it up, Leon, and continue. Look. I switched to a much lower, kinder voice. I'm not here to cause you trouble. I need people. I have ambition, and tell you what. I am here to offer you two choices. I walked up and down, explaining it clearly and simply. First, you get punished, according to the law. Or, you come with me and be my subordinates. Not the church, the empire, or my family's subordinate. My subordinate, what do you say? I didn't expect a quick answer, but many of them almost immediately chose the second option. Huh. That was. Relieving. Of course, I wouldn't trust them just like that. Not immediately. But they will have time to prove their worth and loyalty. First and foremost, I need him to secure the witch. Without anyone knowing about it. I don't know if my parents would approve of it, but for the things I have planned, I will need their help. So I will find a way to convince them. Will you cooperate? I asked, but I only had the witch in my sight, who knew I was pinning this question directly to her. With a slow nod, she gave her answer, and I waved my hand and we started to empty the camp. It was time to go home. Visiting the mountains? That can wait. My travel around the countryside? Will also wait for me. This was much more important. I will take this out, I mumbled, helping her to stand, personally guarding her, loosening the cloth in her mouth, and letting it fall to her neck like a weird, saliva-soaked scarf. Just don't start mumbling a spell, or I will have to do something I don't want to. I can't really cast spells. She sniffled, looking crestfallen. If you think you are capturing a strong witch that can level cities, you are making a big mistake. I don't need you to blast my enemies with lightning or summon a flood. I chuckled merrily, I just need someone attuned to magic to help me with my research. Studying magic is like a blind man trying to learn writing and reading for me. I can't use it. You are learning. Magic. She looked at me weirdly, kinda. It's complicated. Listen. What I said is all the truth. I am here not to punish you all. Honestly, I am here because I heard you were capable of magic. So it was me who brought pain to everyone. Again. She lowered her head, and I saw tears falling to the ground while we walked. Temporary pain. I told you. I'm not going to hurt you, said the soldiers, 
before they murdered my parents. Now, that was something I didn't expect, nor did it add up to the other two's tale. Not that they could have been important or somebody close to her. Well, I had the source walking next to me while holding her still bound arm with one hand. What is your name? Sasha. That is my real name. The one given to me by my mother. The people here call me queen, please ignore that. My lord. They don't know better. No problem. Well, I am Leon. Good to meet you. We have a long road to walk, so... Care to enlighten me what happened? What if I don't want to? Fair. I shrugged. No pressure. How's life? You all look dreadful. I switched the topic immediately, making her raise her head with surprise, amusement, and anger. What? You said you didn't want to talk about it. I have other questions that need answering. No? Okay. Then. How old are you? 16. Or 17? I don't really know. TSK? Tough. Favorite color? Huh? Cats or dogs? Huh? She repeated, getting lost by now. What are your three sizes? Looking at you, they are probably in the minus category, as not even a Bulimic model aspirant looks this bony. Huh? Nah, ignore it. We will. Just stop. She moaned, half crying, half laughing, letting out a defeated sigh. I'll speak. Okay? Huh? I'm all ears. Sasha told ya. And do take your time. I'm not in a hurry. 19. Chapter 8. Sasha. I was born in the city. My parents were simple bakers, operating a shop, selling pans. Nothing more. Nothing less. Sasha explained, her gaze growing distant, reminiscing about those long gone days. My gift manifested itself when I was 8. They tried to hide it because they couldn't bear the thought of me being taken away from them. All mages are whisked away and transported to the capital. Nobody knows what happens then, but they no longer appear. Never again. Well, they get a new identity from what I know, I murmured, and be used as strategical resources in wars. My parents did not want that, but it got out when I was 10. I don't know how. I never really knew how to cast a spell for real. But heavily armored soldiers in the church came for me. Never did anything weird that others could have seen? No, not consciously. I think. I don't know. I was young. Sorry. Please, continue. My parents tried to plead, but they killed them. Without questions or warning. They said they wouldn't when they first arrived, but then. Swords were drawn the moment they didn't pass me over at the first order. When I was transported out, there was a storm, and my hand managed to slip out from their grip, and I ran. I don't remember how I ended up in the forest, but when I came to, I was already far away from everything. Lost. Alone. I'm sorry to hear. You just say that because she looked at me but stopped mid-sentence. I really meant it, and I think she could see it in my eyes. Since then, Sasha turned away, continuing, I have been living here alone. It wasn't easy, but I managed. And somehow, people started turning up year after year. We came across the logging site and built up our own home. As I see it, you didn't really improve your living standards much. At least we lived freely, until now. Oi, I get that you're angry. But you will change your tune soon enough. I laughed, and seeing her face, expecting something nasty, made me grin. No, nothing like that. You are too bony for my taste. Hey, oh, what? Want me to molest you? HMPH, swine. Uh, hey, ha ha. Good to see you have a temper. It will be useful when you're hurting the people. She suddenly realized I was someone who could sentence them all dead, lowering her head, biting her lip. What you said is the truth. I want underlings and you are the best first candidate for it. I will provide you a better life in exchange for your loyalty. So we become servants or get killed? You can choose. Be free and miserable, or be under my rule and prosper. I won't make you stay forcefully. I am dragging you all away because I know you won't believe me otherwise. It is like rescuing strays. I need a rope, trap, or something to catch you and show you that it can be better. As to will you ever wag your tails to me? We will see. I will never wag mine towards you. He. <laughs> You are an interesting girl, Sasha. Look weak at first, but act strong afterwards. Huh, I think we will get along just fine. Dot. It took almost a day to travel back to the castle, where my mother welcomed us after noticing the group of people heading up the road. Needless to say, it was a bit of a surprise, especially for the ragtag group we captured. They probably expected to be thrown into the dungeons or something, but instead, they were herded towards the barracks given a small space where they could settle down for now. It was crammed, but even then, it was leagues above how they lived in the forest. While Oleg oversaw them and kept an eye on Sasha, I went and sat down with my parents. 
who looked at me questioningly but patiently waiting for my explanation. What was there to say besides the truth? So, I laid out all my findings and ideas. I slowly and clearly told them what I wanted to achieve along with building my own city. Big dreams. Mother told me, the first to speak up, preventing father from opening his mouth. But, please, this is the recipe for lime mortar. This one is Roman cement. Or if I want to be fancy, Opus Camingisium. I interrupted her knowing full well what she was getting on about. It's easy to procure and can stand the test of time. I am sure of it. I can do this, mom. Hey, from where I am, 2,000 years have passed, and people still go around taking pictures of buildings built with them. We are surrounded by mountains. Getting the resources should be child's play. I don't know why the Empire is playing on keeping such a thing secret and monopolized. But I don't really care. Get me enough manpower and I will build a better city than anything this world has seen. How? They asked, looking at the recipe, gobsmacked. It was something that was a treasure of the Empire. It was what built the capital city and made it an impenetrable fortress. Even when enemies attacked it centuries ago, their flaming arrows did nothing to it. If the history books were as honorable as I heard, weak fireballs were also repelled by its thick walls. But I could also guess there were other things to it. But, oh well, it is far away from here. Son? Ah. Yes. I flinched, forgetting to think up a reason for this all. But it seems inspiration comes to my help in times like this. I found a witch. What? The two stood up at once as it seemed it was a piece of even bigger news than my recipes and plans. Those were only on paper, nothing but an amalgamation of an idea. Something yet to be proven. A witch was a tangible existence. Yeah, she has been living in the forest since childhood. Escaped from being conscripted. Ah, my parents looked at each other quickly remembering the event. As lords, they knew every major thing that happened here, past and present. We heard they killed her, when she was escaping. Well, evidently not. I shrugged, pushing everything onto Sasha. She is the source of the recipes. Is she now? My mother questioned while I nodded even though I could see the doubts in her eyes. But she didn't pursue the matter any further. This is a big problem, son. Why? I turned to my dad. Nobody needs to know about it. Not to mention. I planned to do this. A bit further away from here. Nobody would notice it. I see it otherwise. Looking at your blueprints. My mom tapped on the table. Looking at my dad. This can easily turn into high treason. He added. Only if they know about it. I retorted. Sorry. But I am not content with playing the guard dog. Father. I read the history books. Your predecessor was wiped out in a nasty incident when beasts pushed through. Our family got to this position because someone got to replace the line that was gone. Not to mention, we are being taxed constantly when they instigate the war with a neighbor. Yet they do not even fund us with food. We need to produce and procure everything for our soldiers. And we defend a land that, in reality, is not even ours. Hell no. Hey, I will defend their backs. Sure, but only because I will turn this region into my home. They don't need to know about it. We will pay the taxes as usual. If we can improve the region and cut back on spending so much on keeping our men equipped and fed, we will have more remaining in our treasury. Then, we can use that capital to invest in the land, improve it, get more back, and repeat the cycle. It's simple. Well, he is your son. My dad whispered, making my mom shake her head. But I was too engrossed in my ideas to listen to them. I want to take Sasha, the witch, with me and help her make me understand many things while I also teach her about what she doesn't know. She looks capable and smart, and nobody needs to know she is capable of using magic. How far have you planned things? Mom asked, her voice extra serious. Not that far. My first and foremost goal is to start building the new city. Honestly speaking, the living standards around here are abysmal. Hey, father snorted watching me as if I said something equally funny and aggravating. Here, I presented my notebook. I wrote down everything. We will have roads, aqueducts, and sewers, just to mention a few things. I am not joking. If you let me, I will do my best to transform this region into something that will overshadow any city in the Empire. Son, your ambitions are something that even I, your father, applaud. But, huh? My mother interrupted, her brows raised high, looking at me. Then back at the notebook. Then back at me. Dear, I think we managed to produce a very quirky offspring. Huh? Asked both of us at the same time. I would say, read this, but I don't think you will understand it. Hey! My father protested, looking hurt. Didn't you always complain to me that you hate that there is no chance to advance higher in the empire? That your talents are being wasted here? Then what should I say? 
HMPH. Er, dear, it is. For us, when we are between the four walls of our bedroom, Mom is right. I agreed at once. It was my chance. We can become so much more, and I am starting to believe our son. She patted my notebook. This is a big chance, and I think my family would also be on board. Not right away, but later on, for sure. And if we fail, our heads will be placed onto spikes. Are you certain? He asked back, and I was totally ignored in the decision-making process. The risks are high, but she looked at me. His ideas did inspire me. Oh well, father clapped surprising me with the ease of how quickly my mother made him agree. If you think it's worth a shot, then all is fine. I trust your brain more than mine. Wah ha ha ha. This is why I love you Tilda. She snuggled up to him, kissing, and I think if they were alone, something else would have happened. But I was no longer a baby. K-H-M. I cleared my throat. So, what do you think? I needed their verbal agreement spoken to me. Not just between themselves. We want to know about everything before you make any moves. They said in tandem. Got it. Of course. I clapped. Unable to wipe off the grin plastered straight onto my face. For starters, I need the people I brought back to rest and get back to strength. I will take care of Sasha myself. And when she gets a bit stronger, I want to return to my original plan. Get to the mountains and find a perfect source for the building blocks for my new city. 19. Chapter 9. Midnight Talks My next meeting with Sasha happened that same night. And it resulted in a bit of misunderstanding. You see, the maids made sure she was washed up, trimmed, and transformed from a bony, then street her into a presentable lady. Now that her hair was clean, it was almost glowing in the color of fire. With proper clothes on, she looked human, and surprisingly beautiful. And, this is where the misunderstanding started. She thought it was done because she was being prepared for me. The fact that she was led into my room at night further solidified this thought in her head. And when the maids left, she only looked at me once before closing her eyes. I was standing on my balcony, enjoying the cool air and looking at the giant moon in the sky, when I heard her starting to strip. Looking back, I was surprised to see her standing there, naked, trying hard to not cover herself. Let's get this over with. She mumbled with gritted teeth. Sure. I chuckled. Walking in. Letting my eyes feast on her naked body while I sat down in my armchair. I didn't know you were a nudist. But oh well. Each to their own. I'm not complaining. Come. Sit. We need to talk. I barely could hold back my laughs. Seeing her shocked face. Realizing I wasn't going to touch her or do anything to her. But. But. You? She mumbled. Turning just as red as my hair. Hurriedly pulling the clothes up and starting to cover herself. You were clean because you stank. I articulated the fact plainly and clearly. You looked like you were taking a bath in the mud instead of water. For crying out loud. I can't have you stinking of my room. Can I? BBB. Be you. She stammered. Unable to speak as multiple things hurt her at once. But that was the truth. Also. Turning a bit more serious. I continued. I have basic principles. I may be dreaming and imagining perverted things in my mind right now, but I wouldn't act on them. So you did think about it. She complained. Which was weird, given the situation. Of course I did. I grinned. I am a healthy young man, and you were stripping before me. Hell yeah. I did imagine things. But I am not a monster. I only indulge myself if it is permitted. Otherwise, I can show restraint. Now, sit, please. She walked closer in the end. Finally taking her seat, looking at me but avoiding my direct eye contact. You could have still done it. I'm more aroused if my partner is moaning in pleasure and just as active as I am. I'm not into fucking the wet sponge. Thank you very much. Tears make me sad and not aroused. I guess having so many experiences made you know that. She asked sarcastically. I'm still a virgin. I was simply raised well. I answered honestly. Well, I was a virgin in this body. For now. Okay. We talked about spicy things. It's time to switch it up. As much as I find you exotic and sexy, even in your emaciated state, we have bigger things on our plates. Before she could interrupt with something unrelated again, I explained my plans to her as clearly as possible. I showed her objectives, ideas, and finally, what I was really interested in, my first magic circle design. It was made through the past few years, constantly adding to it. In reality, I had no big hopes for it to work. It was as if someone tried to paint a picture with closed eyes. I needed Sasha to be my eyes in the future, so I know what I'm doing. What's this? She asked, taking over the parchment and looking at it. Huh? I groaned, fearing your answer. A magic formation I made, 
I have been studying basic magic to the best of my abilities. I am not magical, as I said, but I learned some entry-level theoretical stuff, and with my understanding of nature and how magic operates, I came up with this. I just don't know how stable or usable it is. And, why should I know? I told you, I was never trained. I thought you may get a feeling from it, looking at it, activating some innate connection or something. There's nothing? I asked dejectedly. Really? Not even a little bit? Some tingling or whatever? Tingling? I don't know. This is the first time I see something like this. She mumbled, focusing on it, flipping it up and down in her hands. Try. Using your mana? Maybe? I asked, getting more anxious. But then it happened. With a little bit of mana moving in her body, the parchment immediately reacted, bursting into flames. With a loud pop, it was gone. Ash falling into her lap while nothing remained between her fingers. Ah, she gasped, finally reacting. I didn't mean to. Great, I laughed, a boulder falling from my heart. This was exactly what I wanted. It was, she blinked her eyes, thinking she was mishearing me. Yeah, I was trying to make fire. Well, it could be better. My intentions were to create a feedback loop that would transform the paper into a fireball that remains stable. Using the parchment's basic energy conversation to the initial ignition and then drawing oxygen in to maintain the flow. Of course, it would only be stable until it was fed with more energy to maintain its form. But if I can perfect it, I am sure to build a perfect loop so no outside interference is needed. And once it's on, it remains on perpetually. He he he, I know that is really far away. But, what the nine hells are you on about? She asked, looking at me weirdly. Ah, sorry. Sorry. Nothing. I'm just happy. Happy of what? Of her paper going up in flames? Exactly. Don't you get it? Flames. Magic. It worked. Made by someone who doesn't know magic. Flames are symbolic. Anyway, I will be Prometheus. Huh? Aren't you named Leon? It's from the myth. The one who brought fire down from the gods. Giving it to men. Never heard of it. She replied at once. I never wanted to hear about it either. The church can go to hell. It's not a church tale. I don't think they would even approve it. I chuckled as I don't think anyone knows that tale here. Then I'm interested. She switched her stance at once, looking at me with a surprisingly youthful light. So, who is this Prometheus guy? Prometheus. He stole fire from the gods, brought it down to men, and taught them to use it for his sins. He was punished, of course. Tied out to a rock so birds tear him to pieces, pluck out his eyes eat his liver, and all that. Being an immortal, he always regenerated by the next day just so it can repeat it again. The bastards. So I should curse suddenly, and I could feel it. She really, really hated the church and probably all authority. I will have to keep an eye on that, as such suppressed rage could cause big problems if I let it fester. What happened to the humans? Progress. They started to evolve. I continued nonchalantly. His tale is about progress, standing against the forces of nature. He has given humanity the gifts of fire and hope. Hope helps humans struggle for a better future while fire, as the source of technology, makes success in that struggle a possibility to rise above all challenges and even to face gods. I like this permit. Promise. Prometheus guy. He he he. Good told ya. I want to do the same. As I have shown you, I will build my own place with things that will make living fun and enjoyable. That is the hope part. The second will be fire. I pointed at the ashes on the floor and in her lap. I will bring fire, in our case, magic to the normal people. What if they grab you two, tying you to a rock and killing you repeatedly? She asked, watching my eyes. And when answering, I never blinked. I risk I am willing to take. If all goes right, I will have the power to resist it. I do not intend to go down without a fight. 18. Chapter 10 the first companion. We spent a week back home, and while I spent my time teaching Sasha to read, the maids and soldiers began to whip the rest of my new retinue into shape. They would be mine to command later on, so they had to be strengthened. Not to do battle but to at least look like regular humans. Living in the forest without many skills to speak of, I was surprised they were still alive. Of course, I gave them a chance to leave. If they wanted, they can have left. Go back to the forest and do whatever they want. Seven people did so, and I never stopped them from leaving. Nor did anyone send people after them to silence the bunch, although Oleg was arguing openly with me to do so. I think the firm way I shot him down made Sasha open up a little more, as she never complained when I pressed her to start learning. I don't get this word. She came up to me, holding a parchment as we were walking on a narrow footpath, heading towards my original destination. The open mind where the church got its stones in the past. It's a word for mana, 
I explained to her patiently. I was surprised by the speed she was learning. Memorizing the alphabet with its 44 characters was done by a day. What she was kind of struggling with was recognizing words when those characters were written down in sequence. I say she struggled, but it meant she learned it after around 8 to 10 tries. Still doing it with lightning speed. I suspected that mana had different effects on her body besides enabling her to cast spells. Talking about that. She was shaping up beautifully. A week of normally eating and sleeping started to turn her for the better. Almost making her glow. Her body began to gain back its healthy weight. In return, she was getting sexier by the day. I was a bit jealous. I had to work besides inheriting my parents' genes. She only had to eat and sleep. Not fair. Thanks. Sasha chuckled, putting the parchment away, stretching, wearing a traveler's outfit, and carrying a bag on her back. No need. It is the basic I can do with subordinates who can't read. When you can do it well, we will practice writing and move on to numbers. I can learn that too? Of course. Duh. It is the basics. I will have to teach you more complex stuff. Or how are you going to help me with my research? What if I can't do it? She asked, tilting her head, looking a bit nervous and troubled. Oh well. I will have to look for another mage and find you a profession you can excel in. I will do my best. She mumbled softly, but I did catch it. Not that I am not looking for more mages, but I am not stupid enough to think one would fall into my lap. Eventually, I will need someone who can do some advanced stuff. That would suggest something is very wrong here. Oleg chimed in, still playing the role of my bodyguard. I never heard about mage escapees before. I think they thought I was dead. Sasha shrugged. They did pursue me but then gave up after a while. Do you think they made a report? I asked not Sasha but Oleg, who simply shrugged. I guess they wouldn't tell the higher ups they lost a child. A witch at that. Probably their heads would have been lopped off. Good, she added, enjoying the thought. Relax with the hate train there. I patted her shoulders, making her raise an eyebrow. And Oleg also looked back over his shoulder. What is a train? Both of them asked curiously. Oh. It's an invention. In my mind only for now. What does it do? Does it work with fire? Sasha went on, becoming more and more inquisitive after she realized I hadn't lied to her before. Well, yeah, yes, it can. I thought about it, already pondering how I can lay down tracks and use steam engines to go back and forth. The problem was, where the hell am I going to get steel from, when we can't even build stone houses? Shit. This will take time. Leon, she poked me gently. Drawing my attention back to her. You spaced out. Again. You are doing that too much. Sorry. My train of thought is led from one issue to another that I have no solution for yet. I shrugged. Stopping and quickly drawing up the image of a train on the ground with the tip of my sword. This is a train. I can draw you a more detailed blueprint later if you want. Simply put. It is a carriage made out of steel. Running on steel tracks. You ignite a fire in it. Feed it. And then it can go along those tracks with great speed. Dragging cards you can fill with whatever you want. Even people. Whoa. They exclaimed, watching it with wonder in their eyes while I started walking again. Hey. Sasha rushed after me, catching up quickly. Can you really make something like that? Not now. Too many problems prevent me from making it into reality. How much would it be able to carry, young lord? Well, I looked at Oleg, thinking if he would believe me or not. So I went with an example I think was in the realm of possibilities for them to understand. It could easily drag the church in town behind it. No way. They both exclaimed, and it took me some persuasion to calm them down. I can't give you proof, so it is up to you to believe me or not. But why would I lie? Dot. It was already dusk when we finally arrived. While the two began setting up the campsite, I decided to look at the mine. Calling it an open pit mine was a kind gesture. It was. Pathetic. I recognized the work. How they chipped off ore, with some unknown method, broke off the stones from the side of the mountain. A maybe 10 or 12 meter deep oval shaped pit was dug out, getting some hard stones mined from deep within, but it was nowhere near what I expected. However, I had to realize my expectations came from my previous life, something that was not applicable here. While walking closer, I was also picking up rocks, as many small chunks littered the ground around the area. What I was most surprised to find was that some had traces of iron in them. Why wasn't this area exploited yet? We certainly have an ore vein deep underground, probably running into the mountains. I could only think about other regions already having an industry built out, 
and it's much cheaper to mine there than to start one up here. My evidence to support my conjecture was the fact that we had to buy the equipment for our soldiers from one such region at an exorbitant price, saying it was because they had to ship it from so far away. Bullshit. This is good, I murmured, pocketing some samples before returning to the camp, seeing that Oleg was cutting wood and making a fire while Sasha finished putting up the tents. Why do we only have two? One for me and one for you too. She answered casually. PFT. Heck no, I'm sleeping with you. Oleg you're still big I wouldn't have space next to him. Huh? He laughed, feeling proud, but Sasha was gawking at me. Relax, relax. I walked past her, sat down on a log, and started examining my little rocks. But it was hard as the night settled in by now. It's inappropriate. She protested again, making me look up at her face. Repeating the facts she seemed to forget from time to time. I already saw everything that there is to you, Sasha. We could go bath together. It wouldn't change a thing. Why 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 you? She stammered while I caught whole leg looking at us and showing me a thumbs up, managing to finally ignite the fire. Mmm me told ya. I replied, rolling my eyes. I won't molest you. Relax. Well, she was still unhappy about the fact, but there was nothing she could do. And I won't sleep with another guy when I have a girl with me. Dinner was fine. I always liked barbecuing some meat over an open fire. Although I missed the variety of spice we had in my time. Oh well, maybe later on I can get some. Sasha, even though she was recovering quickly after a good dinner, became extremely sleepy, so she returned to the tent early. I remained, talking with Oleg a little, listening to how the others fared back in the castle before I also excused myself. Have a good night's sleep. Young lord, I set up warning traps and will stay up for now to guard you. Wake me up when you are sleepy. I looked at him, then we will switch. Thank you, young lord. I only smiled before disappearing into my tent and settling down beside Sasha, who was lying on her back. Looking at her, she was cute and innocent. Pushing down my perverted, evil thoughts, I just laid down next to her, letting sleep take over me. What I didn't expect was that my mind would make a move while I was asleep, and somewhere in the coming hours, I did climb onto her, finding a place for my head on her flat chest. I just couldn't help it. She did smell really nice. 14. Chapter 11 Starting out 1. Waking up on her was surprisingly lovely. I mean, she smelled good, and even though she was flat as a washboard, her aura was different. I can't really put it into words, but I felt refreshed and fired up. Unlike her, you are heavy. She groaned, looking wronged, watching me sit up and stretch. Wiping my mouth, and drool like a dog, somebody forgot to push me off. I added snarkily, but she simply snorted, sitting up and turning away, changing clothes. No crying to look away. What? You said it. You already saw everything. She shot back, looking over her shoulder, her face still turning red. Ah ha ha. True. When I emerged from the tent, I realized Oleg didn't wake us up, and instead, he remained up all night, guarding us. No matter. He had timed it up as I spent the day climbing down the mine, bringing Sasha along as I inspected the rocks and the walls of the open pit mine. I don't see anything but stone. What is so interesting about it? She asked, standing next to me while I took notes and pen drawings, marking them in my notebook. Think of it like this, I explained patiently. Look at this as a cross section of the earth in the foot of the mountain. Have you ever seen a birthday cake? Why yes, she nodded. Licking her lips unconsciously. Same thing. The people here cut it up. Now we can see the different layers. Like on a slice of a cake. See these? Yeah. Rocks. No. Look closer. I moaned. Tapping directly at the differently colored vein visible inside of it. Yep. Still rocks. The ones that are rattling in your empty head. What? She flared up. Looking hurt and starting to pout. Stomping in place. You. You. But no retort came from her. Probably because she was still wary of our difference in social standings. Say it clearly. I would not be mad hearing it. I shrugged, giving her time to gather the courage. You? Poopy head. PFT. I chortled, not expecting a kinder garden level insult. But it was cute. Look, little one. Your ding dong is what little. I am as tall as you. I'm still growing for the next five years. But if you want, I can show you my ding dong. And you can measure it with your hand. Eek. Don't flinch. If you can't handle it, don't bring it up. I added with a grin before waving her to come closer. But instead of my spear, I showed her the vein of iron ore before us. See this? This is not rock. This is iron. This shows that there is a vein here that can be mined. We need only the manpower to start digging. To be honest, 
and I could use this man for many other things. Like, don't you just need stone for your city, huh? Look, I shrugged. Trying to say it as simply as possible. I will go step by step. I need stone. Yes. We will start cutting here and expand on the mine. While getting the stone blocks I need. We will also create enough raw material to create cement. And I was thinking of making a blast furnace. Nothing fancy. Just a smaller one. To make iron and proper tools for ourselves. Then, when we are getting work done. Build more and try my hand at steel forging. We can do. All that, yeah, it won't be easy, and at first, it will need a lot of manpower. I can't do shit until we have a proper flow of iron at our hands. I can't order tools from elsewhere, that would raise suspicion in the Empire. So I will have to procure them myself. I will need to train blacksmiths out of some talented people who I can trust. Anyway, when we get the tools, we will be able to equip more workers, get more people to operate at a higher level, and snowball it from there. We can easily set up pulleys around here. So getting the stuff up won't be a problem. What is a pulley? You'll see. It will make things easy. What I wanted I already got from here. A place where we open up our first mine and start extracting the building blocks of my... I mean, our future. I chuckled, returning to the surface, looking around, now watching the mountains in their snowy tops. Next is water. Don't tell me you will conjure a river out of nowhere. She joked. But I just rubbed my chin. No. Not really. I was observing the mountains. In winter, the snowcaps are spaced much lower than they are now. If you watch it, they are slowly coming down as we speak as winter gets closer and closer. Where do they go when they melt? Um, I don't know. Into the air? Like how puddles disappear? Partially, yes, but not really. I humped, tilting my head. When they melt, they don't evaporate fully like that. They have to flow down. And where that is, you ask. Underground. I pointed below our feet. I bet there is a subterranean river here. A what river? The only river I know is a bit further away. Which probably originates from somewhere here. From the one that flows underground. So, I will have to track up the mountains soon enough. Find a source we can use. And start building an aqueduct. Um, I will explain everything. I patted her head gently. Lucky for us. It would be on the slope. So I would not need to set up siphons and whatnot to battle uphill inclines. I can tunnel the water straight into cast helms. Cast. What? Distribution tanks. From then on, I can set up secondary and tertiary ones. From there, pressure takes over gravity's role and distributes water to wherever I want it. This is going to be my first and main priority. Why? She asked. And even if I saw she didn't understand much of it, she was still curious. When building my city... I will need to flatten the land. When doing the groundwork, I intend to lay down the pipings, which means many things. First, I will have to integrate a sewer system connected to that said river. Then, we will get fresh water from the source, which will not just make it so that every building in my city will have drinking water at the ready, whenever we want, but also that it will wash the waste away. I counted the number of wells in the city. We have ample groundwater here which gets renewed constantly. Whatever is under our feet is plenty. I don't get it. You will, in time, or when we start executing it. It sounds more complex than it is in reality. What I am doing here is ancient. KHM, I mean, bare bones. Something that can be done by sheer hard work and by hand. It is a start. If I can, I will upgrade it later on. Like, adding some kind of magical filter to it so we can recycle it without wasting it. Oh well. I will focus on what I can do for now. If I am creating Rome here, I must see the saying. Rome isn't built in a day. What is Rome? Is it something to do with Prometheus? Um. Yes? I answered, jolting back to reality, lying a little. It was best to include the city in myth as this world had no Rome of its own. Dot. Winter was coming in faster than usual this year. Luckily, when we returned to the castle, I located what I wanted. Taking a trip to the mountains and climbing up high, I recorded multiple cave entrances that were probably part of an interconnected system. I say probably because Oleg was adamant about not letting me in and investigating deeper. It was the same with Sasha, who was highly superstitious, saying there had to be monsters living in the dark. If they did, then why was my family guarding the only corridor into the valley? The beasts could have gone through the holes any time then. Anyway, the clues on the walls were clear. They were eroded by water. The snow and ice, when melting, had to flow downwards. And I had the proof I needed that it seeped into the mountain and was going under our feet. It was the perfect filtering process. This was good and bad news at the same time. On the flip side, we can start digging, finding a source, 
I'm building my upcoming city's water system, but this all cement when I open up mines, I must be extra careful of flooding. This was not only a boon but also a hazard. MHM. I will deal with this in due time. I stretched, leaning back in my chair after putting down my quill. MH? Sasha moaned, waking up in her chair, sitting before the fire, balled up in multiple blankets, looking like a burrito. Ah, I really would eat one now. Huh? Did something happen? She grumbled, trying to open her eyes with difficulty. Nope, I just finished my planning. I laughed, standing up and opening the door to my balcony. Close it. It's cold. She cried again, wiggling around like a cocooned animal, only her head being visible. I know, but I need some fresh air. I said, standing there, letting the night's cold air blow past me. I don't know what the time was, but it was probably around midnight, and the sky was covered with dark, gray clouds. Snow was falling heavily, and it was beautiful. How did you survive the winters? After a few minutes, I asked, closing the door and walking to the fire, sitting on the adjacent armchair. It was hard. I don't want to talk about it. Now it is much better, she murmured, avoiding my eyes, watching the fire instead. I see. Well, I'm glad you have let up a little. See? I am not that bad. And I was true to my words. The rest of your people are coming along nicely. Come spring, we will start working. On the city? She asked, turning towards me, happy that I didn't press on and try to make her relieve painful memories. Yep, I have chosen the spot. Starting tomorrow, I will spread a notice through the region of hiring able bodies. I will also take some of father's men and start cutting down the forest, flattening the land. We will use the wood and everything else we dig up. Nothing will go to waste. I don't know how many people will show up. I read your draft. Paying with the opportunity of a better life. That sounds extremely vague. I know. But when the first batch of people who will come to be part of the building process, I want them to be proud of what we will build and look at it as their own. You know, I believe if people think they made it by their own hands, they will protect it to their last breath. This city will be for those who are living in it. I want to create a unity that will center around the people. The individual. You will own your own home, your own property. Something that nobody can take away from you. We will? She asked, still a bit foreign to the idea. Yes. Don't be mistaken. This castle is not mine. Not my family's. The same is true for the people in our towns. We own nothing. It is the empires. We are just being allowed to live here. If they ever want to come down on us, move us, replace us, they can do it. Not in my city. Owning your own home. Where it can be warm when you want it. She murmured, imagining it. And I saw a happy light dance in her eyes. He, <laughs> Of course we will need rules and laws. So, when the construction starts, I will start working on that. So by the time it is finished... We will have rules set down. But that is for me to worry about. What about the tools? Did you solve it? Yes and no. I shrugged. I will select a few people and start opening up the mine that the church used. For now, I have to work with the tools we have at hand. I will be mostly present there, helping them get started. The others can cut down the forest and flatten the earth by themselves. That should be easy. Have you ever thought about resting? I will rest when I'm dead. I grinned. Leaning back my head and watching the ceiling. To be honest, I was way too fired up. And I couldn't wait more for spring to come. 15. Chapter 12. Starting out. 2. I spent the winter mostly inside my room. Either teaching Sasha or drawing up my plans. What I noticed was that her mind was like a sponge. Quickly slurping up the knowledge and managing to retain it in the long term. Whenever I asked her out of the blue, she managed to give the correct answer. No matter when, I was starting to suspect that magic truly affected a mage's intellect. Which was a great boon and a requirement to remember so many incantations and draw complex formations. Now, I only had to find a way to start teaching her magic. But, with my plate so full, it had to wait. The moment the weather started to warm up, and the snow began to melt, I was ready to go out, bringing people away from the castle and collecting everyone who signed up to my notice. All in all, I had around 300 people wanting to work. Many were men with no choice, meaning they were either young or without exact skills that they could sell to anyone else. I was surprised that there were many kids between the ages of 11 and 12, and the oldest looked to be maybe 25. Well, in a place where their average lifespan is 50 at tops, I couldn't be picky. I made sure that Toleg and a few capable warriors took the more significant chunk of workers to the area I marked for them on the map. It was from a day walking from here. And I had chosen a spot where the land looked relatively straightforward, and the mountain was forming a slight U-shape. It would be a very well-protected spot, 
and the mountain range would always protect one side of the city. By my estimation, just cutting the trees down and flattening the land would take the whole year, if not more. That gave me enough time to start the primary industry at the mining site and start producing the building blocks we will need and, if I'm lucky, maybe some iron tools, too. So, with the rest, we headed straight to the mine, and our first move was to create a clearing. We cut out significant parts of the forest, using the wood to build the houses on my instructions and erecting log cabins where the workers would stay. Just that alone surprised them. Which then surprised me as I think they thought they would live in shoddy tents. Please, this will be a site where they will have to live for the foreseeable future. I am not a slaver to not care about their living conditions. Leon, come quickly. Sasha rushed up to me as I was overseeing one of the houses being built, explaining to the people who had to do it as many of them were still unable to read or follow a basic blueprint. What happened? I asked, expecting that somebody already had an injury. It was bound to happen, I just didn't think it would be this soon. Did someone chop off his own hand already? Did a tree crush him? Nothing like that. We found something incredible. Oh, really now? She didn't lie. It indeed was incredible. Now that the open pit and the surrounding area were cleaned up, shrubs, vines, and tall grass mowed down, Something brilliant appeared. It was a magic formation etched straight into the ground. It was already faded, and some places of it were damaged, making it incomplete. But it was there. Whoa! I exclaimed, ordering everyone to make a cordon and keep an eye out for others in the vicinity. This made my brain whirl, and now I understood that they used magic when mining. I just don't know what this did. But it was a magic formation, so it surely had a function. What is it? Can you tell? Sasha asked her eyes twinkling with excitement. Aren't you the witch? Why do you ask me? You tell me. Er, I don't know. I had never seen one until you showed me yours. I only recognize this because of that. Well, I don't know yet. I will draw it down and study it. Maybe I can learn a thing or two. Don't try to activate it yet. I see that it's broken. Maybe it will explode and kill us all if you fuse mana into it. What? She shouted loudly, jumping backward. Ah, hey ha ha. Don't be silly. I don't think it explodes just because you are here. Just don't excite it with your powers. I won't. I won't. She waved her hands like a windmill, now keeping at least two meters from it. Go, look around the mine with some soldiers. Start sweeping away the road and the rocks and try to see if there are more around here. An idea in my mind was slowly forming, but I needed more proof. While the group began to clear more rubble and dirt away, I was drawing the formation into my notebook and I had already found the first problem. One part of it was missing. Not because it was damaged being left here for decades, but deliberately. A chunk of it was cut out and either brought away or destroyed. It's probably a safety measure, so others won't use it. Replicating it will not be easy. But my brain was already working on it. I was referencing the different parts of it and deducting the missing one from what I was seeing. It was truly like an equation. It's a complex one, but I could work with it and, in its weird way, calculate what was taken away. There are more. Sasha came back, running, out of breath, and sweating. She wasn't used to much physical labor, but she wasn't complaining. How quaint. I murmured as there were seven more, smaller ones, etched into the ground, previously covered by decades of dirt, now swept away. These are connection or booster nodes to the main one at the top. What does that mean? Sasha asked, her eyebrows raised as high as possible. These are also damaged but I can infer from their structure that they are all identical. It's probably the same method of setting up long-range radio signals. You need to set receiver and booster towers at intervals, or the signal gets weak. But of course, there is a difference between radio to radio and cell towers and... Leon? Sasha asked, tapping my back as I crouched down, running my fingers on the fading lines of the formation. Hmm? I looked at her, blinking my eyes with question marks in them. Are you possessed by evil spirits? Eh? Why? That was such an abrupt question I failed to process it at first. You were talking strange. K-H-M. Anyway, what you need to know is that these little ones are receiving the magic from the big one, transmitting it towards the bottom of the mine. So, I rushed down, following my conjecture, and lo and behold, there it was. Another big one at the bottom. Same looking at the one at the top. Another one. She exclaimed with surprise while I walked around it over and over again. M-H-M. Keep up the work, and first, finish building the residences. Don't worry about this for now. I stood up, telling the others and sending everybody back to work while I returned to figure this one out. Dot. It was four days later when I finally finished it. I, well, possibly, 
recreate in the formation with the missing part. My calculations should be correct, and I was ready to try it out, to the dismay of Sasha, as she would accompany me in this project. We filled in the missing parts, and I completed the formation with a chisel on all of them. It was crude, but it should be okay, or I may blow this whole thing up, but I am willing to risk it. Standing back at the top, most of the others retreated to a safe distance, and I was glad that Oleg was with the other group and he wasn't here to say no to this all. The rest of my people were not brave enough to say no to me, or to progress. Stop grinning, Sasha moaned, pulling on my sleeves. It creeps me out when we may be just killing ourselves. Oh, please, I moaned, rolling my eyes. These were used here by the church and the empire. This has to be safe and not something destructive. Even if I failed. The worst that could happen is that it won't work. Are you sure? Didn't you tell me it could blow up? If incomplete. But even then, it was just a wild guess. I am not a formation master. Then how do you know that they won't blow up now? She cried out, her legs shaking. What if you turn them into something dangerous? Then we die. So what? We die. That's what. I am not ready to die. Bah. Don't worry. It's not a big deal. Now. Do it. I pushed her before me. Infuse mana into the formation. No. I am ordering you, Sasha. No. I refuse to do it. Come on. Please. I shrugged, holding her waist. But she was like a donkey, refusing to move an inch. I'm not doing it. Find someone else, girl. I grumbled, and with a hard slap, I grabbed her buttocks, slipping my fingers deep between her thighs. It was immediately effective. The sudden feeling drove her over the edge as she flared up, simultaneously feeling multiple emotions such as shyness, anger, and maybe a little bit of excitement sprinkled on top. She was about to turn around and complain, but her unstable emotions excited her mana, which activated the formation. Hi! She screamed, forgetting to be angry at me, and I failed to pull my hand away, watching without blinking, wanting to see everything. The formation glowed in a blue light, looking extremely beautiful. It remained active as I saw it pull energy from the air and recirculate it while, one by one. The smaller ones also lit up, going in steps until arriving at the one at the bottom. Then nothing. They simply remained glowing and doing nothing. We didn't die? Sasha asked, on the verge of tears. No, we didn't. I whispered, still needing her bottom. Stop it already. Hmm? Oh, sorry. It felt nice. I laughed, letting her go and walking forward. Leon? She tried grabbing me but missed my hand as I walked into the light. Ooh. I exclaimed at once as I saw my hair be raised, and I felt my way gone the moment I was inside its effective area. This is an anti-gravity formation. Huh. Now I am really getting it. I can improve this. Ah ha ha. Huh? What are you talking? Wah. Her scream came because, seeing how I was okay, she followed me. But the moment she lost all feeling of weight in her petite body, she panicked. And now she was floating and spinning in midair. It is an area of effect, I continued turning towards her, letting myself flow there with a grin. Nothing has weight here. They could easily mine out of the rocks and transport them up from the bottom. Probably had other tools that made it extremely easy to cut it out and bring it away. Ha ha ha. With this, building my city will be a piece of cake. Help. I'm floating away. She wailed, throwing her legs and arms everywhere. Not even listening to me, her body slowly rising upwards. You are hopeless. While shaking my head, I grabbed her ankle pulling her down and stabilizing her. Clearly, the formation could be kept on for a long time without further input from anybody. My next question was, how do I turn it off? Probably with a spell, but I knew none, and I don't think Sasha could do it either. So I simply scratched a part of my added solution, and it immediately disrupted the flow and turned off at once. Huh, I can feel my body again. She exhaled with relief. This was too weird. No, my dear Sasha, I answered, licking my lips. Feeling I hit the jackpot, this is something that will change my world. You'll see. 12. Chapter 13. First Building Blocks When we opened up the mines again and carved out the first blocks, I taught the people here how to use the pulleys we set up in the previous days. I decided to go with the safe route and lift out the smaller blocks like that, as the first job would be to start building the road. It would give a basic understanding of how it works, what to look out for and a good training regime. Pump up their experience a little before we start building something more extensive. What surprised me was how quickly they learned and adapted, and after a month or so, we had a stone road leading out from the mine to the main dirt road that was frequently used. Of course, it was not a perfect, modern road, but it was a start. While they were working on it, I also perfected the magic formations, 
worked on it tirelessly, and figured out what to add to it to turn it on and off without damaging it. Are you sure this is going to work? Sasha asked as I was finishing up my modifications on the actual magic circles. I am. It is simple mathematics. Even if it is about magic, it follows laws, which I could infer by studying them. I just need a witch to start operating it, as I am useless when it comes to mana. I wouldn't call you useless if you managed to decode something that nobody else could. You just don't know people who could. I can't be the only one. Anyway, enough of rubbing my ego. I laughed while grinning at her. I would be much happier if you started rubbing something else. MHM? What? She asked innocently, which in turn made me shrug. I don't know if she was serious or simply learned that I can joke around if I feel I am abusing her innocence. Nothing. Instead, start focusing. Like how we trained. This time, I wasn't groping her buttocks. It made me a bit sad, but oh well. While working... I recalled all the old rumors of meditation and gathering key from my old life. A bunch of nonsense gathered from books and shows. But as magic was real here, I thought it might work. And it did. Sasha quickly exclaimed while following my retelling of fantasy concepts. She felt weird, as if little bubbles were running through her body. She did not manage to cast a spell, but she did manage to summon her mana. Her body became a bit more glossy, like being oiled up and her eyes were glowing in the color of fire. I don't know what it really meant, but it did work, and when standing close to the formation, it reacted at once, activating. Now, with my modifications, the moment Sasha is starting to think about calmness and imagining a serene scenery, the magic circles picked up on it and followed suit, slowly powering down until they were dormant once more. I was already figuring out that Mana had to work like some kind of wave or frequency or something similar along those lines. They can be tuned and attuned to a base frequency, from where they can be excited or calmed down. I still needed more information to get something concrete, but this was an excellent start. With it on, I ordered Mana at the bottom to place the first giant block of stone on it, pulling along with ropes tied to its side. It was too big to lift with any primitive pulley system we had set up here but we didn't need that. The moment it touched the first formation at the bottom, it floated up like a balloon, no longer weighing anything. Our men just had to hold the ropes, lead it up, and follow the road and the active nodes until they arrived before us. Ha! Huh, this is pure awesomeness. I laughed, clapping while many others were looking on with mouths wide open in pure wonder at what was happening. Magic is something else, Sasha murmured, looking down at her hands. Finally realizing that her talent was not a curse and not something terrible but instead a gift with great potential. It is. I agreed, patting and rubbing her back. People, look out because it will leave the anti-gravity field in a few moments. I shouted at the others. And soon enough, when it got in arm's reach from the central circle, the stone block fell to the ground with a loud thud. By my estimations, it had to be at least around a ton in weight if not more. And it was floating like a piece of cloud a moment ago. Wonderful. What are we going to do with it? Sasha asked me as I was rubbing my chin, wearing a big smile. I have multiple ideas about how to transport it. The first is very simple. I started explaining it, not minding that everyone else was listening in on it too. I can etch the formation onto the block itself, and we can transport it that way, or we can create tools for transporting, like a carriage that has the formation and generates the field itself designed for ferrying stones back and forth. The second one sounds more practical, she said only after a brief thinking. I also think so. For now, we are going to cut out similar blocks, expand the mine, and just keep bringing them up here. I want everyone to get used to how mining works, and we will continue to build the roads. I clapped, and with that, everyone was getting back to work, including me, trying to design this world's first heavy-duty truck. And hopefully, this one won't roll over and kill me. Again, dot. My first prototype was ready in a month. Of course, it was not a real truck, far from it. I took the platform of one without the many confusing elements, as it will be dragged by horses anyway. But I did improve the wheels, the suspension, how it turns, and all the little, important details so it would be more sturdy and more easily controlled. It was made out of wood, as we had that resource in abundance, and it made it easy for me to grab my tools and touch the magic formation onto it. And, this was when I ran into the first big problem. Sasha can activate it, and my new glorified card had achieved the desired result of producing an anti-gravity field. We could even load up four giant blocks of rock onto it, tie it down, and start dragging it around. All was good. Right until it got far away from Sasha, and it simply turned off. 
The weight of the stones immediately crushed the whole thing, breaking it apart, scaring the horses, and causing minor chaos. Shit was the only thing I could say. I had to realize there was more to the official magic circles than I first thought. Then I remembered how my basic book told about the crystals that mages use, helping them cast powerful magic. I wanted to investigate and see if our found formations had something to do with that. See if they have something like that in them. Maybe they were made with a tool or with a conduit of such properties, but I couldn't risk ruining them. My modifications alone were a significant risk, and now I felt lucky that I didn't screw it up. So, for now, I was stuck. Well, Sasha, I think it will be up to you to transfer the stones back and forth. I shrugged while waiting for a new car to be made so I could etch my magic circle onto it. It will help me train and improve my magic, she answered. Sounding fired up. I was happy to hear it and glad to see she was changing her mind. Maybe she was right. If she supplies the formation with mana, perhaps something will be triggered within her and evolve. Who knows? Magic could be unpredictable, and I was hoping for some good results. The first trip with the Mind Stones to the area where the majority of my people were clearing away the forest happened not long after my second prototype was completed. It took two days to get there and it also showed me that building the road was instrumental. The moment we were off from the hastily built stone road, back on the dirt one, it was so uneven and filled with bumps that I was afraid that the stone blocks rocking back and forth would destroy my magic circle. Then we would have been stranded. Luckily, that didn't happen. After arriving at our destination, I called for Oleg and explained to him that they would have to break the stones down and start building a road as soon as possible. I outlined it to him on the map, and if everything would go smoothly, we should have the first primary road towards the mine. While the others were amazed by the card and by Sasha's gift, I took a walk around the now flat and empty space. I was honestly surprised at how quick they worked and managed to clear away the landscape. I had nothing but praising words leaving my mouth. Good. Good. Very good. I slapped her legs back, looking around with a grin. While working on the road, I also want you to select people who show talent, who are functioning hard and doing their tasks precisely. What are you planning? Young Lord, here. I gave him multiple parchments with my drawings of the city's basic blueprints. We will have to dig these trenches to the exact same parameters as I detailed them. They have to be the same in position and match my calculations. This is really important. For now, don't worry about it. But keep an eye out for those people while building the roads. I need to start selecting people who can then lead others and break them up into working groups. Start motivating them with food. The talented ones can get a bit more every time. Okay, a bit more meat and what not. Really? He asked, finding it weird. But he wouldn't go against me. I knew that meat was a bit rare in peasants' diets, but I was going to slowly switch that up. We still have some beast meat in the castle. Even you bulky bunch can't eat that much. So yes, instead of letting it rot away, I already made a deal with father. Some will be transferred here, and those who work hard and put in the extra effort will get to eat more of it. Simple. I will trust this to you. Leg. So use it and motivate them. I want a selection of skilled workers so I can teach them easily. You can trust me, young lord. I will not fail you. Um. Can I ask what the purpose of this? He asked, watching my plans. Why will these holes be under the city? This, my friends, is what will make it possible that water gets to every home and also brings the waste away. No more shit stains. No more stench. This will be a clean city. You will see. 15. Chapter 14 foundation. While the works were underway, Sasha being the carrier of the building blocks between the two sites, I took Oleg and some soldiers up the mountains. Now, it was time to get water flowing to where I wanted. Not even Oleg's complaints could hold me back this time. Following the clues on the rocks left behind by the snow and ice, I could easily infer where to look for our underground spring. It turned out I wasn't wrong as only on the second day I found a cave where I can hear water rushing after 10 minutes of exploring. Guys above, Oleg exclaimed as he followed me with a torch, finding it hard to squeeze through the openings with his huge body. But he was right. What we saw was mesmerizing. It was just as beautiful as my first glimpse at this world, an enormous cavern with flowing water coming from above, rolling down in a hidden riverbed inside the mountain, rushing forward, heading into a hill, disappearing to who knows where. It was like a scenery out of some movies from my time like an ancient cave of dwarfs. I just hoped some Balrog wouldn't show up, killing us prematurely. Perfect, I clapped, feeling happy but also careful not to slip. Watch out, as it's not just cold here, everything is wet. You fell into the river, 
and you will be gone. No coming back from that. I learned the rest while finding a place to stick my torch. Besides our fire, a low, pale blue light came from some kind of moss on the walls. I wasn't a biologist, but I was sure it wasn't something we had in my world. Be careful, young lord. Oleg warned me while I lowered myself, lying on my stomach, and got close to the river bank and put my hand into the fast-flowing body of water. Whoa, chilly. Scooping out a handful, I tasted it. And even though water doesn't really have a taste, it was the tastiest of all the waters I have ever tried. Hell, it was more refreshing than any energy drink I had while studying. Perfect. I backed off, standing up and looking at the rest. We will mark it. First, we must widen the opening so workers can come in. We will open up a new channel to the river that will lead to the outside and tunnel it down to our city. Young Lord, cutting through the mountain will not be easy. It is extremely sturdy. I know, but it is a must. Plus. It's only the cave's opening. After I get my workers who are precise enough, I will start on the foundation of the city. What iron tools do we need will be imported for now. But building an advanced blacksmith's workshop will be easy after water flows towards where we want it. I can build a kiln, and we can start producing our own iron tools. Dot. Winter was coming just when we were finishing up the foundations. It was also the first time I could prove to my parents that my formula was right and produced the Empire's secret formula. Cement. I laid down the first blocks myself as my people began to use the stones and my cement to build the base of my city. Mainly the future sewers and pipes. Of course, cutting out round rocks was hard, so I opted to work smart, not hard. We used big blocks that we drilled a hole into. It was much easier that way, and we just laid things down like playing Lego. Although, they didn't get my reference when it slipped out loud from my mouth. Oh well. They couldn't understand why this was important, and when finished, they asked why we bury them. It would have been too much to explain. So I just smiled, saying they will see it next year. This winter, beasts attacked once again. I brought Sasha along, heading to the walls so she could witness it, and something interesting happened. The beasts noticed her very quickly and stopped attacking, like they were afraid of her presence. This made me sure that they had something magical in their blood. Probably in their meat. Too. No wonder my dad and his soldiers grew this big. Eating magical beast meat. Don't eat them. I blurted out, looking at Sasha, who was thoroughly confused. Why? They are juicy and tasted good when you gave me some. Yeah, but I think it's what makes my dad and the soldiers this bulky. If you start looking like a wrestler, I ain't touching you. Who would want you to touch them? She flared up, almost screaming, drawing the nearby soldier's attention. You, of course. I replied with a shrug. It is you who love to touch, always climbing on me while we sleep. You are heavy, you know. No, I'm not. I rolled my eyes. You can push me off any time, yet you don't. If you dislike it, you are free to leave my room anytime. HMPH. Exactly, I concluded, grabbing her waist. I remember someone caressing my hair this morning. You are up? She yelped, but before we could continue, my father's loud snort interrupted us. Now the prey has gone. TSK. Go back to your rooms and produce a grandson already instead of screwing us over, son. Well, that made Sasha blush to a color that was similar to my hair. But dad was right. So I led her away. We needed a grandson. KHM. I mean, if Sasha's presence alone stops a beast from coming near us, how will we replenish our spent resources? Dot. Will this work? She asked looking at my blueprints in our room the same night. She was wearing a puffy, thick robe while I knew she had nothing under it, which did make my imagination wiggle a little. Yep, I answered, finishing washing my face in a bowl, wearing only a towel around my waist. By now, she was somewhat used to it, even though she did complain about it on the walls, mainly because others were around us. When we were alone, she was much more accepting. Was it because she was timid? We will run these pipes down from the mountain, she asked again finding it inconceivable. They are called aqueducts. Until better options surface, these will do. You will be surprised how effective they are. If done right, they will be there even after 2000 years. While I oversee the building of those, you will work with others on this, I explained, walking next to her and hugging her waist, which, this time, didn't result in her complaining. The big one? She picked up another blueprint, looking at it. By now, she could read it fluently and understand the numbers placed on it. Yep, that will be the main cast helm. Distribution tank. Exactly. I giggled, slipping my hand down onto her buttocks. No resistance. Nice. Water will gather there, and with the pipes connected to it, 
it will be sent through them. Yep, with this, the city will always have running water in every home. Want to take a bath? Open it, and water will flow. Fountains, decorative trees, and flowers, everything is possible. It will be nice, sweet smelling, and... And stop groping my ass, she moaned, pulling away as I was leaning very close to her neck, breathing down on it. Bummer, I can't focus like this. I don't want to mess it up. So teach me instead of fondling me, you perv. Okay, okay. I answered with a chuckle, sitting down with her and explaining how it would actually work. Not just to her, but throughout the upcoming days, I also taught the selected few we invited to the castle for the winter break. Dot. The moment winter was over, I let our people out. To my surprise, the moment it happened, another group was waiting for me, asking me to join up with us. Looking around. I realized we essentially tripled our workforce. I hoped some new faces would show up this spring, and it did happen. With more people, I could accelerate things. I delegated them under Sasha, so she should be their overseer and make sure they work as intended. Their first job was to clean away the building site while Oleg brought the others to the mine, which had already expanded to double its original size. When Sasha ran out of materials to build with, she could go and pick up the next batch at the mine and bring it away. Easy peasy. If everything goes as planned, I will be able to finish the aqueducts by summer and connect it to the piping. I would do a test run to see how the water flows before we close it down for now. Hopefully, all will go without major issues, and I can start building the first part of the city. Or more precisely, the inner city with my own palace and with some surrounding buildings made out of stone for the most talented people we have. I can't just build my own as it would make me look horrible. Maybe even make them think it was off for my own place, and they will have nothing. Of course, only some of the city would be built of stone. I want variety, so I have already made plans and decided to mix a little bit of Asian and Roman architecture. My own palace will be such a mix, using stone blocks for the base and a wall surrounding it, while the actual building atop it will be built of wood copying my knowledge about the Forbidden City in my memories. The most genius thing is they made it without nails. So I won't need to waste iron on it either. My only wish was now that I would have at least 10 Sasha with me. The fact that with her around me, I could carve my perfected formation into anything and turn it weightless was a godsend. It made handling the materials extremely easy, and one man could raise any blocks above his head and place them down where we needed him. Maybe they built the pyramids with magic. I was honestly considering it. Young lord. It was Oleg's shout that knocked me out of my things. And I saw him and Sasha run towards me, looking panicked. Not cake squares into a sophisticated... What happened? I asked with worry. To the mines. Quick. He said, almost pulling me away while Sasha grabbed onto my other hand. What the hell happened? I asked again. Now with a raised voice. A witch. Another witch. She exclaimed, and I managed to kick out my own leg. If not for them, I would have landed face worse on the ground. What? Are you sure? Yes. Sasha nodded rapidly. She is young. Before I had a chance to activate the formations, she went close. And it came to life. She is a witch. Now. Isn't that interesting? I whispered, my excitement going through the roof, and soon... I was the one who was dragging them along to meet her. 17. Chapter 15. Merlin. Arriving at the mines, I was already fired up, wanting to meet my, I mean, our second witch. I was curious as to whether her skills would be different than Sasha's or if she had more affinity towards spells. Who knows? When we arrived, the people there already surrounded a very nervous and trembling kid who barely reached up to my waist. Damn. He was short. And young. There she is, Sasha said with excitement explaining everything again, but I wasn't listening. My eyes were scanning the kid's features. The long, black hair that was gleaming unnaturally, the intelligent, dark brown eyes and the almost perfect, doll-like body. Yeah there was a problem. My senses were not tingling. Not like when I first looked at Sasha. This one was not a witch, but a warlock. Hey, Sasha, why did you say there was a witch here? Because she stopped in her steps, looking at me, getting confused, and now multiple heads were turning back and forth between me and the evidently little boy before me. Have you asked his name? Mernon. She replied at once. Merlin. The small boy murmured, correcting her and making me almost choke on my saliva. That is what I said. Sasha protested, not finding the errors in her words. What? The. Fuck? Is he like me? Or. Is this some kind of cosmic coincidence? Is it the joke of a laughing god or something? What the hell was going on? I had to test it. 
so I spat out something that he would have surely heard about if he was from the same place as me. KFC, what is that? Sasha questioned me, just as lost as everybody else, but I only waved my hand. I already got my answer, which was nothing. I was looking at him without blinking, and he wasn't faking it. He was from this world, so the name he was blessed with had to be something. Local. Hey, maybe transmigration works both ways? Who knows? Forget it. I clapped, smiling. Merlin is a boy's name. My little dummy. I knocked on the head of Sasha, who started pouting in discontent with how I spoke to her before everyone at the scene. I am a boy. Merlin nodded, reinforcing my conjecture. And to show proof, he simply pulled down his trousers. Stop it, now. Sasha cried, rushing forth, pulling it up on him. Scaring the kid, huh? While everyone laughed, I rubbed my forehead because this was not what I expected. Don't get me wrong, I'm glad that there is a second witch. I mean, wizard, warlock, whatever, in my group. But, I don't want to raise a kid, not yet. Where are your parents? I asked before doing anything else, and the boy looked around as if he was searching for them. I don't see mom and dad. We came together. But they are not here. They are probably at the other construction. Sasha interjected at once. I hope so. I added, glancing at Sasha. Okay, okay. We will get to the bottom of this. But first, Merlin, can you walk to the magic circle? Yes. He was surprisingly obedient and didn't look afraid at all. He was either a chill little guy or simply didn't comprehend anything yet. My guess was a latter option. Watching. I couldn't help but smile as the moment he got close. The formations came to life without him doing anything. Didn't have to concentrate or think about it. It just happened. This, in turn, told me he had more tremendous potential than Sasha. Or controlling its output had to be learned by anyone magical and wasn't something in eight. They presumably can't handle it at first, which is how they get discovered. I think she also thought about Merlin being stronger than her as she began to shuffle around with a bit more nervous look, playing with her hair. Okay, I walked forward. Bringing the kid away. Let's go and find your parents. I smiled at him, gently stroking his head. And he was quickly at ease, smiling back at me, holding my hand while I instructed everybody to get back to work. Dot. Dot. It took me a day to finally find his parents as they were at the construction of my city. They were clearly worried themselves sick when they were separated when we split the group. But they were too afraid to go and find their kid or ask for help. They never even dared to look me in the eye when I appeared with their son. When I told them he was magical, the mother fainted, which was unexpected. But I can understand it as usually, that meant the kid would be brought away, never to be seen again. Well, not anymore. I spend hours to calm them down, tell them things are changing and that I won't take him away but he will be under my supervision. I had to put it into terms that they would understand easily and not think it would be me who would take him away in place of the church or something. So, I made her my first squire. A knight in training, to be more precise. Hearing that, their panic and fear turned into ecstatic happiness while Merlin tried to make sense of everything happening around him, turning his little head back and forth. In the meanwhile, Oleg also arrived, bringing me the information about the parents, and I learned that the mother was, well... A mother. The father was registered as a leather worker, but he has been out of work for a long time, and they were in a horrible condition as a family. No wonder they applied. Going by the fact my workers received a place to live and food was already better than their current situation. After nobody wanted to look after little Merlin, they brought him along just to get separated right at the start. Lucky? Yeah, I think I am. Very much so. Okay. Here's the deal. I sat down with the family once I made my plans. E3 will now stay in a permanent location near the mine. I need little Merlin there so he can operate the magic formations during the day and study at night. That frees my Sasha up, and she can help here, at the city's construction, without being forced to go back and forth. Study? They asked, seemingly lost. Sasha will visit every night and teach you, and I mean you, the parents, and Merlin, how to read. I will? Sasha flinched, sitting next to me. Until now, she was lost in her thoughts and I bet she was extremely nervous as her face was way too gloomy. Was she fearing I would replace her as the mage I fuss about? That I would pay more attention to Merlin now as he showed more incredible talent? I will be honest. She was kind of cute when worried. Duh. I flicked her forehead. You can already read, write, and count. I have too many things to focus on, so I can babysit everybody. You are needed in the city to help out with its building. But you can travel to the mine at night and teach Merlin and the parents for an hour or two. 
We the parents wanted to say something, but I shot them down with a wave. I don't care about excuses. Public education will be mandatory, so I don't want to hear justifications for why I should not care about you. I don't need people who can write down their own names. You will learn, or you will go home. Without Merlin, of course. Good. I nodded, not giving them a chance to argue. Not that they would dare go against me, I think. Merlin, you will be a good boy and learn under Sasha Chan. Yes, Chan, Merlin and Sasha asked, and I flinched because I was letting my idiotic brain blurt out something stupid. It means, lady, in the magical language. I lied, and they simply nodded, believing me without questions. Good for you, Sasha, that I am a proper gentleman and don't abuse my power by giving you some idiotic title. Anyway, that is not important. What is important is that you focus on things you can do, which is studying. How old are you? Merlin? Um. She looked at his parents before the mother finally answered. Five? My lord. MHM. I see. Well, kids have to be kids. So let him play around until we need him to study or turn the formations on and off. I am not here to rob someone from his childhood. I ended the meeting with a clap and stretching. While leaving, the parents couldn't stop thanking me for the incredible generosity. And I won't lie, it was getting a little bit tiring. So I left them to a leg to escort them back. Huh? It was already dark, so I gave up ascending the mountain and overseeing the works on enlarging the entrance to the underground river. You were surprisingly kind. Hmm? Was I? I asked with a smile, looking at Sasha, who walked up next to me with a gentle and warm smile. The thing you said. About being a kid. I? I really like the sound of it. Something I wish I heard when I was at the age of Merlin. Huh. I think it's how it should be. In the future, kids won't have to work. Not until at least 16. Later on, maybe even 18. Yeah? Then what about me? Or you? Not everyone can be that lucky. I laughed, hugging her waist, pulling her close, and she wasn't protesting. Instead, she went really silent. Hey, Leon. Am I useless? Huh? Why do you ask that? You know why? She shrugged, looking at me with worried eyes. I can do nothing. That is how I feel. I can't cast spells or come up with things you do. I can only... Memorize stuff and do what you say, turning things on and off. But I don't make those things. I never even came up with anything unique, dummy. Yeah, Naya, don't pinch my butt. She complained with teary eyes, but I just laughed, continuing to knead her bottom. You are worrying too much. Yes, Merlin showcased today the clear evidence that he is mana. He has special powers, maybe even a lot of it. But you, too, don't forget that. But he is better at it, is he? I grinned. Watching her look at me while holding onto me and ignoring my hand on her buttocks. Waiting for me to continue. Or it's the effect of your life. Huh? Think. You were told not to use it. Then you escaped and lived for years. Suppressing your powers to not get caught. Of course. His mana displays itself differently. He was never told or taught to hide it. Your experiences are totally different. My dear Sasha. So don't worry. You are not worse. Not even by a long shot. Really? Really? I leaned in. Kissing her cheeks, which turned her bright red. And finally, she realized where I was continuously touching her. So she quickly broke free from my holding. She was cute and embarrassed. She was a bit chaotic. She didn't mind it when it happened, but the moment her mind switched into overdrive and met with a new impulse. Or she was reminded of her position. She immediately turned bashful once again. But I didn't mind. This weird duality of her was a product of her life. She wanted to appear strong and somebody who could do anything. Who can survive? Then when she got lax, she suddenly switched into a young girl. Someone bashful. Somebody who was still innocent. I will. Teach him right. She mumbled, playing with her hair and scratching her cheeks. That is what I expect from you. I can't be everywhere at any time. So I need capable people. You are one of my first trusted subordinates, Sasha. I am counting on you. Um, I will. Do my best. Thank you, Tilda. I walked past her, patting her shoulder before heading to find Oleg. As I had to talk to him about Merlin and his family. I was happy about them, but I was naive. What if they are moles? Agents who keep an eye on the territories for the Empire? The chances for it were low, of course. But not zero. So I wanted trusty people who I knew I could count on to keep an eye on them at all times. 13. Chapter 16. Sasha's Thoughts. I felt confused. And afraid. I really did. I have been teaching Merlin for the past four days. And he is frightening. He learns much faster than I did when Leon began teaching me. I only had to tell him about the letters. How they look. How to write. And then he can mimic it after a few tries. Of course. 
Copying what I do is not the same as understanding it, but after four days of learning half of the alphabet, he already recognized them in a book I brought along. He even managed to guess words with letters he didn't know about yet. He is so much smarter than I am. If he keeps this up, he will overshadow me before he turns six. Will, will I be left behind again? Left alone? Sent back to the forest? Will he send me to the church? Ha, huh. he said he won't. But what if I start screwing things up? Nobody answered these questions. And I just couldn't ask Cleon. He would say no. Of course you would. What should I do? Mr. Moon. Anytime such questions came to me, I always liked to look up at the full moon. Of course, it couldn't give me answers. I knew that. But it was something I always did. There was nobody to talk to for a long time when I was younger. Huh. I feel really lost. If Merlin gets powerful and more valuable than me in magic, why should he keep me around? To clear my head, I decided to go to the place we built and he called it a washroom or something like that. It was just a wooden shed with two big basins filled with water. One was to wash off the dirt and grime of our bodies, while the other was to rinse ourselves when finished. The others had already changed them, so both basins were filled with clear water. The task alone was a long trek back and forth from the closest water source. That problem will also be solved if he can build those aqueducts. Looking into one of them after lighting the candles on the walls, I saw my sorry expression looking back at me. Ha! Huh. I was ugly. My hair was messy, no matter what I did. And I was way too skinny. Small. That was the only thing I could say when I took off my clothes and looked at my tiny breasts. After eating well, I gained some weight, so my bones were no longer sticking out. I expected them to change, too. But they didn't grow. Most of the women I saw had way bigger ones. Not to mention Merlin's mother. She had a pair that were as big. As as my head. Ugh, so unfair. No wonder Leon refused to touch me when I first visited him. Well, that was not entirely true. Turning around and looking over my back, I tried to see the reflection of my butt in the water. He liked touching this part. Maybe because it was more round than my breasts? It does look more plump than those sorry bunch on the front. Perhaps I should let him do it more? He did kiss me on the cheeks. Yes, I should let him do more. Especially now. What if another wish pops up? Just as talented as Merlin, but indeed a girl. With big boobs and a wide hip. Someone who is perfect for bearing children. I can also do that. Yes, I have been bleeding since long ago. I can have kids. His kids. Um um. Yes. I agreed to myself. Shaking my bottom a little and watching it jiggle in the reflection. It was the perfect plan. If I am not good enough in magic, I can be useful in other things. Then he won't send me away. Then I can stay with him forever. That would be the best. Dot. She did what? I asked, turning towards Oleg, who was standing at the entrance of the cave where at least 50 people were working with pickaxes. We were in the middle of creating the trenches that would make a new tunnel for the river to flow through straight into our stone pipes. Then, the aqueduct would sneak down from here directly towards the city. She burnt down a cabin. The fire was stopped in time, but it was completely demolished. I don't care about that. How's Sasha? She is fine, Oleg answered, gulping. And I knew there was more to it. Continue. Just tell me as it is. She said she was reading. Cookbooks. Imagining how to make. Meals. Making the movements with her hand. And. I urged him to continue as he stopped constantly. And I was too anxious to hear what happened. She said it just combusted. Then the fire spread and the cabin was ablaze at once. With her in it. My lord. But you said she is uninjured. I yelped. Imagining her being burnt badly. Disfigured. I wouldn't want that. She suffered enough while growing up. She deserved better. If nothing else, I will take care of her still. That is the weird thing. My lord, the fire didn't hurt her. She stood amongst the flames, unbothered, uninjured. It couldn't burn her. It consumed her clothes, but her skin remained untouched. She said she didn't even feel the heat. She just panicked that she destroyed one of your creations. Oh, are you telling me? She is fireproof? Or was it because it was her magic that conjured the flames? I... I don't really know. My lord, it was. Frightening to watch. It burned so fiercely that it left only ash behind. Not even charcoal. The wood it is. Gone. How interesting. Take me there. I want to see this. After arriving, the scene was... Magical. I mean it. The fire clearly burned in a circle. Right around where the cabin was. Nobody dared to go close. Afraid it would burst into flames once again. Worse, Sasha was huddled up, far away from the camp, sitting below a tree, hugging her legs, face buried in her knees. She looked like a lost puppy. Wait here. I told the rest, 
Emuno Leg opened his mouth and tried to stop me. I looked back at him with eyes that told him I was not in the mood for nonsense. If you dare to tell me it is dangerous, just stop now. Don't anger me. Walking up to Sasha, I couldn't help but smile as I crouched down, gently patting her head. She flinched and looked up with her puffy, red eyes. I knew at once she was bawling them out just an hour ago. I didn't mean to. She sniffed, but I simply laughed, patting her head and pulling her into a hug. That was awesome, eh? She yelped, going so fast she didn't expect something like this. I am sure of it. Oleg told me everything. Damn, I wish I could see it again. Again? But, 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 this means your magic reacted to your thoughts. I bet you focused on it really hard. I? I don't know. But Leon, I am dangerous. What if I burn you? Or anybody else? And with that, she hurriedly pushed me away. Don't be silly. I resisted and pulled her back into the hug again. I don't think you would have want to burn me. So it won't happen. I trust you. But I trust you got it. Why yes. She relaxed, hugging back, burying her head in my chest. I'm not angry. Quite the opposite. This made me excited. And now I have so many questions that need answers. But I don't know how it happened. We will figure it out. I already have ideas. But we need to check something first. Eh? She yelped as I pulled her up. And when the covers fell, I realized that she was naked. Oh my. I looked her up and down, remaining unabashed and letting my gaze have its fill. You little exhibitionist. I like it. An exy. What? She murmured, going red in the face. But she wasn't covering herself now. You like it? Really? Duh. I do. I grinned, grabbing her waist with two hands making her shake it, and she followed my lead obediently. Sexy. Come. I stopped her teasing because seeing her face, I was having trouble saying no to my sword that was unsheathing itself in my trousers. Cover yourself as we are out in the forest. I don't mind if you want to go commando around me, but let's do it when we have no more work to deal with. What is a commando? She asked again, dressing up in the blankets that were given to her, looking like some kind of ancient Greek philosopher as she followed me barefooted. Don't worry about it. I cleared my throat, looking at her. I can't molest you when we still have work to do. If you want that, come to my tent tonight. Okay. She nodded, making me trip as I was just joking. Well, I wouldn't say no to it. She is a cutie and a kind girl. I would happily accept her if he accepted me. Ugh, focus Leon. He, what? Your face went a bit red, Leon. She giggled, finally in a good mood. As we arrived back at the scene of the fire, I was walking around in for minutes before ordering the others to bring a broom over so I could gently sweep the top of the ash away. I was careful not to touch the ground, and my first thought proved to be true. Do you see this, my dear Sasha? I asked with a wide grin. There are markings on the ground? She crouched down, looking at it curiously. Burned into it. It is a magic circle. I nodded gently and continued cleaning the top trying not to scratch or make it indiscernible. There was a magic circle here. One that we missed? Nope. I answered, seeing her mind work. But I continued, not waiting for her to catch up. This was left here by you. Your mind and mana, to be exact. Do you know what this means? And not really. She answered honestly, lowering her head. Magic is part of nature. I whispered, licking my lips. This means that all magic circles are part of the law of nature. What you burn into the ground. My dear Sasha is a fundamental law of nature. Now, help me carefully clean it as I want to draw it. What we have here is the world telling us one of its core laws concerning magic and mana. Ah, hey ha ha. This is awesome. What I didn't see at the time was how Sasha was looking at me. As if I were. Those eyes would have made me kiss her. The look of relief and rising joy, making her eyes glow, just made her even cuter. But, later on in life, I did have time to see her like that. Many times, in fact. 17. Chapter 17. A Steamy Night. It was at night, and I was holding a torch, coming down from the mountain, feeling extremely tired. We were making good progress, the stone pipes were all in place and being reinforced, and I was using my cement solution to make doubly sure they were well sealed at the points we connected them. My day went with going up and down constantly, following the route we made and ensuring everything was in order and up to my expected quality. The real test will be when we let the river flow into it and see where it starts leaking. Meanwhile, the people below were also surprisingly ahead of schedule, laying the foundation of my city. By now, everything was flat, 
The sewers and pipes were finished being connected to the first cast helm. As per my instruction, they were laying down square stones at the moment and creating the streets to my exact specifications. I had to make it known multiple times that they followed my words to the letter, and the newest, talented trainees did not disappoint. I took a measure, and they nailed the width of the main street and the side streets connecting to it. The former could accompany four carriages side by side while the latter was perfectly wide enough to let them go past each other. I did not bother their brains about the extra information, I just told them it would be so everyone could come and go without holding up the other. They did find it weird that everything was measured at a 90 degree angle, but they will get used to it. When I arrived back in camp, I could already see the base of my future home, the buildings taking shape in my mind's eyes. It already looked gorgeous, but, for now, the place I returned to was my personal tent. I felt bladdered and exhausted as I opened the flap, coming in, already in the process of undressing. I only stopped when I realized I was not alone, in way of pulling my pants down. Sasha, I asked, surprised to see her here, wearing only a nightgown, a maid, bath, water. She mumbled, red from her toes up to her ear, but she was telling the truth. My tent had a big wooden basin, and hot water was steaming inside of it calling me like a siren. Huh. I blinked my eyes rapidly, but I was not to refuse her and squander her efforts. With a confident move, I stripped naked, not covering anything on me, letting her stare. He he he. I won't say it was the first time she saw something like mine, but going by her eyes, it was the first one she liked Tilda. Thank you. I do appreciate it. I'm beaten. With an honest sigh, I sat into the tub, enjoying the water that was hot enough but not so that it would burn me. A moment later, I lay forward, letting Sasha kneel behind me with a sponge and something that counted as the most luxurious item of all. Soap. Of course, it was not the simple rough soap they were making here, made out of ashes from an oak tree, some tallow, lime, and whatever else, mixing and stirring to create it. I ensured ground up petals were added to it with some extra ingredients so that a pleasant scent and wasn't so rough. In my time, this would be the choice of girls. Smelling like a flower bed but damn it. I also liked it. Who wants to smell like the forest horn? The waves? Or whatever other bullshit when you can smell really lovely instead? It was something that I mentioned in passing to mother once, and since then, my household has started producing it, albeit in very few numbers. Oh well, once my city is ready, we can mass produce it, and everyone can say bye bye to smelling like a wet hog. Wait. Could I make a profit of it? The thought alone stiffened me and stopped Sasha from moving her hands, thinking she hurt me. Leon, this is nice. I moaned, not thinking about the idea further, and as she scrubbed my back, her fingers were ever so gentle that I could fall asleep amongst them. T thank you. She replied to me, clearly startled but also happy, continuing it with a bit more vigor. I like it when you are this caring. It is so relaxing. Why don't you come and get in, too? But, um, I... Um, okay. I was surprised once again. I expected her to say no, but instead, I turned around and watched her undress while looking sideways. She tried not to glance at me while she climbed in, and in return, I had time to inspect everything about her. From up close this time. You are beautiful, you know that. No, she murmured, playing with her hair. I could see she was genuinely embarrassed this time. Back then, when she first came to my room and threw her clothes off, it was because she didn't look at it as something. And um, it was just a thing to get over with, but now, it was completely different. Come here. I smiled, holding her hand, and before she could protest, I pulled her into my lap, hogging her from behind, splashing water everywhere. But I didn't care. Kaya. She yelped, flustered, especially when her butt slid up against my sword. Sorry, can't help it. As I said, you look stunning. Will. Will you? Do. You know? That. She murmured, looking everywhere but at me, letting out another yelp as I started rubbing her body all over before settling down on her perky, small breasts. Nope. Nope. She stiffened, looking back at me over her shoulders while I kept grinning. Oh, does this mean you wanted to do it? I? Never did it before. Well, I could have guessed it. And it seemed we were going in circles. It is something that is very important, Sasha. I continued talking, seeing how it was relaxing her body. Or. Was it the result of my unruly hands? Her nipples stood erect in that attention, listening to me just like her. It is not something to squander away, especially for a girl. I? I? I'm glad you opened up, but if you are in a rush because you're afraid that you can only stay here if you catch me in your net. 
then you will come to regret it. Look, I am more than happy to do it with you. I want to do it with you. But I'm not a guy who takes advantage of those I care about. I see that you are confused, I whispered, and she nodded honestly, making me chuckle as we sat in the wooden tub. Well, I'm going to help you relax a little, and maybe it will clear up your head. We will. Come back to this after you reorganize your thoughts. What do you mean? Uh? She pressed her legs together with a loud moan, but it was too late. My right hand had already slipped between them, and my fingers were exploring her hidden valley, looking for the little monument erected in it. It wasn't hard to find it and start caressing her in a way she knew nothing about. I enjoyed how she constantly wiggled in my embrace, moaning and grabbing onto my hands, her nails digging deep into my skin. She was beautiful and a bit wild. Holding her right breast in my left hand, keeping her from escaping, I played with her body until she finally reached the peak of sensation. I felt something warm hitting my palm underwater, but I didn't mind. It was quite the opposite. It made me proud. I still got it. Watching her eyes go misty and her body falling limp, I just held her in my arms, letting her breathing return to normal, gently rocking her like a baby. When it did... I realized she had also fallen asleep yet still clung to me. I wasn't about to wake her up, so I sat there, caressing her, and after I got out of the tub, I tried her and myself. Even through all that, she didn't wake up at all. I was still pinned up, and had no outlet for it now, but it was worth it. I wasn't in the mood to dress up, and neither did I put clothes on her. I simply carried her to my bed and snuggled up to her while pulling the sheets above us. This is the way to go to sleep. For sure, it didn't take long to doze off and relive everything in my dreams. He, <laughs> In there, it was even more exciting as I didn't have to hold back at all. Should there be chapters like this later on? Yes. No. Total voters. 37. Cast vote view results. Oops. We ran into some problems. View results. Should there be chapters like this later on? 13. Chapter 18. First step. Complete. Waking up the next day was wonderful. Sasha was pretty silent and didn't know where to glance, but she didn't look angry. She even helped me dress up, so I guess all was fine till yeah. After eating breakfast, I was at the back of the city, heading up the trail, checking the last connections of the piping before we began. I would lie if I said I wasn't nervous. Back up top, people had already carved a path into which the underground river could split. They were only waiting for my word to break away the last part. When it happened, I was rushing down, following the pipeline, watching for leaks, but miraculously, it worked like a charm. By the time I arrived at the bottom, Sasha was already waiting for me, excited, explaining how water was filling up the castellum. Great, let it be filled before opening the valves and letting it flow through the city. It was the first stress test. From here on, what would push the water forward was not gravity but simple pressure. I watched with my breath being held as it took some time, but the open ends of the smaller thinner pipes finally burst out with water, signaling everything was working as intended. I watched as it flowed towards the finished sewers, disappearing from sight. Goodbye, shit-stained streets and the smell of pigsty, huh? While I observed my success with a wide grin, others were also marveling at what we had just achieved. They finally realized this meant no more walking a kilometer to the river and back, digging wells, or taking a bath only once a week. They already knew that the pipes that were sticking out of the ground were where houses would be built. It meant everyone would have their own bath in their homes, which was still like a fairy tale for them. Great, I think the first step is complete. Time to move on to the real work. The real work? Sasha asked, thinking we were already doing that. Oh yes, I nodded, hugging her waist and pulling her close. Get to building homes. I will split up our people into three groups. The most talented ones we collected will work with me as I begin building my palace. The second group will assemble the surrounding infrastructure and housing. The third will continue the work on the roads and in the mines. I already laid out my plans. They just need to follow them. And we can build up houses quickly. Maybe do it in a year. In a year? Sasha gawked, thinking it was impossible. Why not? The magic circle of ours that makes things weightless alone is a great tool. One man can lift up any log, block of stone, whatever, and place it where it needs to be. The hardest part of construction is out of the window like this. Oh, this reminds me. I had an idea. About magic? She chuckled, and I nodded with a grin. Remember the circle you burned into the ground before? I was studying it and comparing it with what we have at the mines. Some parts are an exact match. Which, in turn, told me a lot about how they work. So I made several new ones. I want to test them out. Should I bring Merlin here? She asked, 
a bit unsure and loosening your smile, which became less honest. No, I need his presence at the mines. We are still working, producing what we need. I told him to start expanding, and it turns out the iron vein we found runs deep. Anyway, he is still a kid, and I want you to work with me now. At least you can control your magic better. Um, anytime. She nodded like a chicken. I feared her head would suddenly fall off. Dot. Later that afternoon, further away from the constructions, I had my new inventions ready and set up. I called them inventions, but they were nothing more than three thick wooden logs and one blacksmith's tong. I was accompanied by Sasha, Oleg, and a few other soldiers who were here to protect me if anything goes wrong. Well, if it does, I don't think they could shield me from it. What do you expect to happen, young lord? Oleg asked, being apprehensive of it, feeling it had to be dangerous because we had come so far from the city. They are all different, and I don't know if my calculations are right or not. You see, making up magic formations is like working out an equation with too much unknown. I can think of some possible solutions going by nature's law, but I looked at them. We're going to explain it further. What I am saying is that there is a high chance they messed up and made bait alterations, so they will blow up. Sasha yelped, making me twitch my mouth. No, they will simply not work. Oh, she blushed, lowering her head and making me chuckle. Okay, there is no reason to delay the inevitable, so come Sasha. Try to focus on the first log. I inscribed the formation on the back of it. Um, right. Stretching her hand out, she looked directly at the prepared specimen. And when the magic in her activated, we heard a loud, scary grunt. She quickly stopped while jumping back a meter. On the other hand, I was looking on with sparkling eyes. The thick log that should weigh multiple hundred kilograms broke apart as it collapsed in on itself. What happened? Oleg exclaimed while I waved my hand, silencing him. Success, that's what. I laughed loudly before explaining. I tried to reverse the anti-gravity properties. It doesn't work as smoothly. Or else this wouldn't have happened. But you said it was a success. Sasha whispered, walking up to me, holding my shoulders, and looking out from behind my back, ready to pull me away if necessary. It was. The formation increased its weight so much that it broke apart. The problem is, the weight should have been spread out evenly. Instead, it was concentrated where I put it. So it needs weaking. Young Lord, does this mean that the thing became heavier when activated? Much, much heavier. I nodded. Happy to see that Toleg caught on quickly. What use does that have, young lord? Right now, I don't know. I'm just experimenting. But we could use it to drop a pebble on someone but raise its way to that of a boulder. Or steal away something, and then a wooden door becomes as heavy as a mountain. We can find a use for it later. I just want to see if my modifications work as intended or not. Okay, Sasha. Now do the same with the next one. Um, the second log was a bit more fiery. Literally. On it. I combined the one formation that Sasha left behind and parts of my very first invention that I showed her. In a snap, the wood it has gone up in flames like it was dosed in kerosene. It burnt like the sun, and it wasn't put out even after Sasha stopped concentrating. What was strange was the fire didn't spread but remained attached to the log where the formation was placed. Pouring water over it also had no effect, it just turned it into vapor and kept burning on merrily. We had to wait until only the ash remained behind which only took around half an hour. Fire that can't be put out. That is a potent weapon, Oleg exclaimed, rubbing his hands together. The soldier's eye. I looked at him with a smile. I had a different idea. If I can adjust its intensity and how long it can burn, it would be the perfect addition to the blacksmith's workshop. Not to mention, I could use it to create kilns and smelt steel with less effort. And in a more eco-friendly way. Huh? They looked at me, and I just waved their questioning gazes away. Next. Please. I knew she wanted to ask what the eco-friendly meant, but she was also curious about the next experiment. Yet nothing happened. I? Um. Is it my fault? She looked at me after a minute of trying, but no results. Nah. I shrugged, patting her head. It is on me. This one, I fiddled with too much and probably messed up many things. I was hopeful, but I could be lucky all the time. This one is a dud. Okay. Try the tongs. Pick them up and try to pick up the log with it while focusing and using it. Eh? Oh okay? I knew she wasn't getting it. Not until she touched the tong. The moment her magic interacted with its handle and its embedded formation, she already realized what I wanted to do. This is genius. She yelped, and I just shook my head. You are a shark. So, try it. We will see if it is truly genius or not. If it doesn't work, 
you must take the compliment back. Luckily for both of us, it worked. The moment she used the tongs to hold the log, the anti-gravity effect spread over, and she could lift it without issues. Now, just like the simple tools, the thing held with it also had zero weight. Whoa, young lord. This is magical. Oleg clapped, looking at Sasha, holding a huge and heavy object above her head with one hand like some kind of circus freak. It is magic. I winked at him, for now, it only works in a witch's hand, but I will tackle that problem later. But this would also have many uses, especially as we begin our second step, finishing the city, Sasha asked, and I just nodded. Exactly, young lord. Is there a third step? Oleg asked curiously, and I couldn't help but grin. Of course, I can finally have a base then to start exploring magic for real. Do you think creating a city is my ultimate goal? Nah, it is just to have a headquarters to create even more wild stuff. Ah, hey ha ha, you will see. I would say, I feel like playing a 4x game, but none of you will get that. What are the 4x's? Sasha asked putting the log down and deactivating the tongue before approaching me. Explore, expand, exploit, and exterminate. I want to explore magic, expand it, exploit its features, and... Well, the last one is something I don't want to do so let's forget about it. 10. Chapter 19. Progress. 1. Next. Working in the summer heat, people were already praising me, which, I will be honest, felt extremely good. I tried to remain nonchalant about it. But it was hard. The reason? Simple. With the water system in place, the workers, when tired and thirsty, just had to go to some of the finished fountains and could fill their canteens with fresh, cold water. Just like that. After the end of the day, they were ordered to take a bath with soap. Okay, it was a soap they had to share. But still, I wasn't ready to stink up my new city just yet, huh? Everything was going smoothly. So much so I was worried that something would go very wrong very soon. That would be more like my luck. The last time I felt so confident in my life getting on track, I died. At the moment, I was working with the rest of the first team, building the palace where I would live. I walked amongst them, helping set up the wood and carve their shapes out perfectly, instructing them how to place them together. The foundations were already in place, and as I had previously planned, I was copying many things from the forbidden city of my previous life. It was easy to create the base, made out of its stone walls and steps. The difficulty came only later. It was hard to teach them how to carve out the wood how I needed them. We wasted a few weeks until they started getting it right, but it did not matter as I expected it. What was really helpful was that all the materials were weightless with Sasha around and my formations working perfectly. We could juggle around multiple heavy and tall wooden beams and rock slabs as if they were simple feathers. I just can't get enough of magic, it seems. Young Lord, Oleg walked up to me hurriedly, and I was surprised to see him back so soon. A month ago, I sent him and my parents meant to visit my mother's region to procure more tools and draw iron for us. It was best to do so discreetly, and I was surprised to see him come back so swiftly. Already back, everything went smoothly. I put down my used and old tools ready to take inventory of my new ones. Yes, we hurried as fast as possible, and the men are bringing in everything as we speak. Great, we will first distribute the pickaxes and the rest to the mines to speed up their production. I want to have houses ready by the first snowfall and test out my designs. You really plan to spend the winter here? He asked, feeling unsure about my idea. It doesn't look much, but trust me. Plus, I have to spend a cold season here. I need to see how it is to modify my plans accordingly. It won't be easy, but it is crucial to do so. By then, the main room for me should be ready with a fireplace in it. I will survive. The problem is the flooring. I will have to lay down a nice parquet, but I also want some pleasant fur rugs. If we get beasts attacking us again, try to kill some and skin them carefully. We will keep an eye out, young lord. He saluted, taking it as a mission. Also, there is something I think I need to report. Hmm? What happened? I looked at him questioningly as his voice was strange. When coming back, we visited the mines and... I don't know what the little Merlin kid is up to. He is weird. Explain. I furrowed my brows, placing my hands on my hips. The kid was weird. With a capital W. I still thought he was similar to me in a sense. But nothing happened whenever I tested him. He was gathering the people around him and... Teaching them. He was... Teaching them? That was not something I expected. Yes, reading, writing, and counting. He was even holding lessons about how to be a good citizen when getting the chance to move in here. I won't lie, 
It was a bit funny to see a small child standing on a stone slab, lecturing the adults. But then I forgot to look at him as a child. He was like any adult, my lord. Teaching them to be a good citizen, I repeated whisperingly, and my surprise was clearly visible on my face. We didn't intervene because he was saying only good things about you, my lord, and warning everybody to behave and be thankful. He sounds like someone who will be a good negotiator. Or a teacher. Nice. You are not worried? Oleg asked. And I just smiled at him. Nope. Look, if the kid is smarter than me, has ambition and a skill. Sure. Let him take over. Young lord. What are you saying? What? I laughed. I don't really care. If he can do it better, do it. I will survive. I will find a way to thrive. We wouldn't let that happen, young lord. We would first die before abandoning your family. Oleg shouted, slapping his chest. Okay. Okay. I wasn't that serious. I wouldn't just go away. I don't like to be pushed around. But I'm not a sore loser, either. If someone beats me, so be it. I'm not afraid of starting over nor of death. Please stop, young lord. This could place perilous ideas into some heads. You are right. I nodded, scratching my chin. You see, I will have to think about defending ourselves too. But, oh well. Too many things to deal with, too little time. How much raw iron did you manage to gather? Twenty ton. Young lord, a whole yearly output of a small mine. He answered proudly, it did cost a lot for us, but we managed to do it. Good, you did not disappoint me, Oleg. Huh, I hope you will follow me when the city is ready. I need a general under me. It would be my honor. He replied with twinkling eyes, going to his knees immediately. We erected a temporary warehouse, going place them there. In the winter, I plan to perfect the new magic circles and create a blacksmith's workshop. One that the world has never seen before. It sounds exciting. My lord. It does. With the new tools and with what I will be able to make. We can start up our own mine in earnest. Dig out that sweet ore vein and fire up an industry. No more buying expensive shit from others. We will make our own tools and weapons. Dot. Phew. You are still just as good with your hands. I moaned as Sasha was sitting on my back. Massaging my shoulders. None of us were anything right now. And most of the camp was already asleep. Thank you, she whispered, still a bit shy. But after what happened previously, she no longer complained when I did something. Is it my hands rough? I have been helping with chiseling the wood, and it's... Nope. I cut in, enjoying her touch with closed eyes. It is perfect. Don't stop, please. At first, after a brief pause, she murmured. I couldn't see how the buildings would work. But now, it will be beautiful. Leon, I had never seen anything like it before and how it all comes together. It is nothing like the houses in the town. Nothing. Style over function till ya. Huh? What I mean is that sometimes, things have to look cool. Beauty is something to be looked at, and enjoy it. And with that, I surprised her by turning around. A moment later, I was lying on my back, and she sat on my stomach, looking a bit troubled but touching my chest. Yep. I was right Tilda. I'm not that beautiful. Then look behind you. When she did. I chuckled, seeing her body jump a little because of noticing the spear between my legs. See? I'm not lying. Should I? She asked it with such a weak voice I almost missed it. I would be thrilled if you did. That night, it turned out to be it was my time to be fiddled with. Like how I did it to her previously, this time, she took advantage of the situation and played with my recorder. I couldn't help but get hypnotized by her swaying hips and glistening valley, so when she was least expecting it, I pulled her back and took a deep lick. Tasty Tilda. I mumbled with her on my face, drawing out surprised and panicked moans, but I wasn't letting go. Luckily, she is a quick learner. When she realized I wouldn't stop, she copied me, and my personal popsicle landed in her mouth. She was immature with it. She even scraped it with her teeth multiple times. But damn, you fell cake squares into a sophisticated, the pure, raw passion behind her actions, the loud slurping noises, the wildness in her. Wanting to please me just as much as I was doing it to her. It was the best blowjob I have ever received. To top it off, she never let it go. Not even when I warned her. She simply took it all in, drinking it without a fuss. When no more was coming out, she didn't let go. Only continued cleaning it up from top to base before finally sitting up and looking back at me. Gasping for air. It is really bitter. I bet. I answered. Just as out of breath as her. You are something else. With a chuckle. I grabbed and hugged her close while she snuggled up to me. Will we? She asked, 
letting me caress her body while she put her leg over me as if clamping down on me to not run away. Not here. Not in a tent. Wait until the winter, when we have our own room. And then we will do it there. It will be the perfect blessing for our new home Tilda. Um. Okay. She smiled. Looking way too cute with her innocent eyes. I am curious about something. What? She asked at once. Already in a chatterbox like mood. Do witches give birth to magical children? Or not? Exclamation mark. She had gone mute at once. Her whole body turning pink and burying her face in my chest. No longer wanting to talk to me. But somehow. Her hold on me got even stronger, and I was sure. Something extremely sweet was tickling my nose for the rest of the night. 3. 